Hello and welcome to Capturing Christianity. My name is Cameron Bertuzzi. I'm exposing you to the intellectual side of Christian belief. Today on the show, we're having a theological discussion between two Christians on whether God is a person like us. And ultimately, this is a discussion about the nature of God, basically. It's also a very important discussion because it will inform, I think, the way that we do apologetics. So some views of God are actually impervious to certain atheistic objections. We may get into that in this show. We may not, but... Either way, uh, my guests are Stephen Nemesh. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Let me actually go ahead and pull you up on the screen here. Was that right, Nemesh? That's right. Excellent, excellent. Uh, my guests are Stephen Nemesh and Dr. Ryan Mullins. Stephen is a classical theist. Uh, more on that term in just a moment throughout the show. And then Ryan is what he, he calls himself a modified classical theist. So he's a classical theist with a twist. Well, thank you guys for coming on the show. If you can, Ryan, take about 60 seconds, introduce yourself to my audience, and then we'll do the same with you, Stephen. So I am a philosophical theologian living in Scotland. Uh, I'm American, as you might be able to tell from my accent. Uh, so I've written a lot on God and time, uh, God and emotions, the incarnation, Trinity, disability theology, problem of evil, uh, these sorts of things. Uh, so my main interests are really on looking at alternative models of God and seeing what arguments we can develop for and against each model of God. Excellent. Well, let's do the same with you, Stephen. So take about 60 seconds and uh, just introduce yourself. Yeah, I'm a PhD candidate at uh, Fuller Theological Seminary. I study with Dr. Oliver Crisp. Um, my research is basically also in philosophical theology. Uh, I have written on various uh, theological topics. Some of my first publications were on the question of universal salvation. Uh, I have a paper written with my friend Jordan Westling on <clears throat> intercessory prayer, uh, as understood by Catherine of Siena. I have recently been working on the question of the relationship between scripture and tradition for Christian theology. And my dissertation is tentatively titled The Constructive Theological Phenomenology of Scripture. So especially recently, my studies have led me into the, the world of phenomenology and that method for doing philosophy. Excellent. Well, I've got links to both of these guys. So Ryan has a, a show podcast. And so that is linked in the description of the video. And then also as well, Stephen has a website, so that's linked in the description of the video. If you want to learn more about my guests, click on their links. Just do that. It's real easy to do. Well, <clears throat> excuse me. If, if you guys want to learn more about apologetics, you want to see intelligent conversations between Christians and atheists, and in today's case, Christians and, uh, two Christians, then subscribe to the channel, turn on a little bell so you can get notifications when we post new videos. And all right, so let's let's talk about what we're doing today. So this is actually the first of two discussions that we have planned between Stephen and Ryan on this subject. And so this show we're hoping is going to be a kind of introduction to the literature on God as a person, the nature of God, these these two sort of competing views, or it's not just two views as we're going to see from Ryan in a moment. So <clears throat> this is serving as an introduction to the topic. So the second show is actually going to be more of a, a dialogue, a disagreement between Ryan and Stephen. So we're going to see them kind of disagree about what their views, the nature of God is. But this one, as I say, is just an introduction just to get the, the some of these terms out there and, and some of the basic concepts that we need in order to understand the landscape and why this stuff is even important, right? So let's start with the first one. And uh, the first question that we have is on classical theism. So what is classical theism and how does it conceive of God's personality? Let's we'll start with you, Ryan. Or actually, should we start with Stephen? Because he's yeah, start with Stephen. Classical yeah. theist here, yeah. Classical theism is a certain understanding of God and of his relationship to the world, which uh, has its roots, at least in the Western world, in ancient Greek philosophy, especially in the philosophical understanding of Plato and Aristotle and later uh, inheritors of that tradition, such as Plotinus, and then their Christian uh, appropriators of that philosophical school. Uh, there are Corollaries to classical theism in other religions as well, like in Hinduism, there are certain forms of Hinduism that resemble Christian classical theism in certain respects. Uh, but basically, classical theism is an idea about God that understands the nature of God through the relation that obtains between him and the order of finite beings. Uh, basically, what classical theism says is that God is that in virtue of which finite being exists, or finite beings, you know, have being. Um, and 
the classical theistic position basically understands finite beings such as you and me, horses, cats, you know, Pat Metheny, uh, whatever, um, as being in a certain way. There are certain conditions, ontological conditions, which apply to all finite beings whatsoever. And God is understood as not being anything like that. Uh, precisely because the conditions of finite being are limiting and they necessitate an explanation. Precisely because finite being is a certain way, there's need of something that is not finite, that is not, uh, you know, that does not exist in the same way uh, in order to cause the finite being to exist and to give it existence in every moment. And God, therefore, is understood by way of contrast with finite beings. Uh, with respect to the question of whether or not God is, is a person, I'm sure we'll talk about this in more detail later, uh, but the short answer is that classical theism uh, does not conceive of God as a person in the way that we, as finite beings, are personal. Um, if God can be described as a person, it would have to be in a way that is radically different from us, because, again, our personality is an aspect of our finitude. It's an aspect of the fact that we're finite and limited in various ways. So classical theism understands God as being radically different from us as persons and also from everything as a finite being. Ryan, is there anything else that we need to know about classical theism? Yeah, so to add to what Stephen's saying is there are four unique classical attributes that really make this model of God um, stand out from others. So these four classical attributes are timelessness, immutability, simplicity, and impassibility. So I'll define uh, timelessness, immutability, and impassibility, and then uh, I'll let Stephen define uh, simplicity for us so we can get a better grasp on like the details of this model of God. So to say that God is timeless is to say that God necessarily exists without beginning, without end, without succession, and without temporal location or extension. Uh, and then sometimes people state this in terms of saying that like God exists as a whole or all at once in a timeless present that lacks a before and after. And there are a lot of issues I could go into in Philosophy of Time to unpack this, but the, the main underlying assumption here is that time, whatever that is, involves succession and change. So like God does one thing after another if he were in time, but if you want to say God's timeless, then you're going to deny that God does one thing after another. And so this leads to this affirmation that God is immutable or unchanging. And the classical understanding of immutability is that God cannot change intrinsically or extrinsically. And this is so according to thinkers like uh, Augustine, Boethius, Peter Lombard, and, and others. And so a contemporary classical theist like Paul Helm, who affirms timelessness and immutability, he makes it really clear that God cannot undergo any intrinsic or extrinsic change or what we might call like mere Cambridge changes. Uh, and so Paul Helm and Natalia Ding, um, uh, Dean Zimmerman, Roderick Chisholm, they point out that if God even underwent these extrinsic or these Cambridge changes, then he would be undergoing some kind of succession and not be timeless. So that's, we have to rule those sorts of things out. Uh, now, impassibility is, uh, a, is a, has like about three kind of claims built into it. And so the claim that God is impassable means that it's impossible for God to suffer. It is impossible for God to be caused or moved or influenced by anything external to God. And then third, it is impossible for God to have an emotion that is inconsistent with his perfect happiness, his perfect rationality, and his perfect moral goodness. So in other words, to say that God is impassable means God cannot have any emotion that is immoral, irrational, or unhappy. Because the classical theist, the theistic tradition affirms that God is in a state of pure, undisturbable bliss. And so those are those three kind of attributes. And then uh, the, the fourth one is simplicity. And so I'll let uh, Stephen define simplicity here. I would define uh, divine simplicity in the following way. God is not subject to any of the forms of composition or complexity or in intrinsic differentiation, whatever, uh, to which finite beings are subject. And I'll give an example. Um, you know, you can use the Aristotelian categories of form and matter. A human being is a composite of form and matter in the following sense. On the one hand, there is material stuff that the human being uh, is uh, constituted from. A and on the other hand, there is the form, which is a kind of a pattern or an idea or a design or whatever that is imposed on that stuff in order to make a human being. If you were to take my body and you were to cut it up into a lot of small pieces and then lay them all out on a table, you would have all the same organic matter. You would have all the same material there, but you would not have a human being because the form of a human is gone. Um, and form, again, doesn't just mean a shape, uh, because in Aristotelian philosophy, a dead body has a shape that resembles a human body, but it's not a, it's not a human body. So uh, the form um, is kind of like a, you might call it a principle of intelligibility. You might say that the form is that, when, that which makes certain material 
to be of a certain kind. So the form of a human being is what makes this collection of organic material to be a human being and not just organic material. Um, God, according to the doctrine of divine simplicity, is not a composite of form and matter. He does not have a form. He does not. He's not composed from matter. Uh, and the reason why is that anything that is a composite of form and matter is finite and limited and contingent, and its existence depends on something else. Uh, we see that the existence of a form matter composite is precisely the unity of form and matter, which uh, unity is not explained on its own. The same form could be uh, informing different matter, and the same matter could take on a different form. So the two elements don't have any necessary connection to one another. Uh, that's why it's necessary for something outside of the form matter composite to unite them. And of course, there can be nothing outside of God that unites him. He's supposed to be the rock bottom level of reality. Uh, so therefore, he is not a form matter composite. And a similar argument can be given for any other kind of metaphysical composition that you can come up with. God is not a body with various parts. God is not a composite of essence and existence like uh, every contingent being is and so on. So effectively, the, the doctrine of divine simplicity, in my understanding, is, a, is a, a negative statement. It's a statement that God is not subject to any of the forms of metaphysical composition uh, which we recognize in the finite beings of the world in which we live. Is there anything <clears throat> Excuse me. Is there is there anything else that you'd like to add on simplicity, Ryan? Yeah. So to just kind of like expand a little bit on what Stephen's getting at here. So typically, when we talk about doctrine of God, we'll say God's got all sorts of different properties. He's got distinct actions, like uh, you know, providentially arranging the world, uh, performing miracles, and so on. And so what simplicity says is that all of these properties, all these attributes, we want to say of God, they're actually identical to each other and identical to God's uh, essence and existence. So all these things are identical because you have to have these very strong identity claims. Same thing with God's actions. You can talk about all these different distinct acts, but in the simple God, all these actions are identical to each other such that there's only one divine act. And this one divine act is identical to God's essence and existence such that you can just say God is an act. And that sounds weird. Um, Catherine Rogers is a contemporary classical theist, and she just says, yeah, it sounds super weird to say that God is an act, but what do you want? I gave you a simple God, so this is what the entailments are. I would add here that uh, we can define God perhaps more positively, uh, given the doctrine of divine simplicity, as a pure undifferentiated reality. Mm -hmm. uh, in contrast, you know, in contrast to somebody like me, I am not a pure undifferentiated reality. I'm composite in various ways. I have various qualities and features that are actualized right now. For example, my being seated or my speaking. I have various qualities and features that are not actualized but are in potentiality, such as my uh, potentiality to be silent or my potentiality to stand up. Um, so my being, my existence is composite in this way. I have a lot of different features and a lot of different uh, qualities, some actual, some potential. Uh, that make up who I am. Whereas mm -hmm. with God, according to the doctrine of divine simplicity, there's nothing like that. He is just a pure, undifferentiated actuality. Uh, he doesn't have potentialities. He doesn't have like multiple different properties that compose him. He is just pure being, we might say. All right, so what are some of the competitor perspectives on God? How do they conceive of God's personality? And I guess this is where we'll start with you, Ryan. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so there are a bunch of different rival models of God today, and it's a bit difficult to provide a taxonomy for these different models, because uh, the taxonomy that the internet has kind of latched onto is this classical theism versus theistic personalism distinction. But most scholars who are working on models of God, they just ignore this entire category of theistic personalism because it's it's really coarse-grained. It lumps together like a lot of really radically different models of God into into the same category. And so that's just, I mean, that's just, that's just bad scholarship. So a lot of people working on models of God, they just go, kind of, I, you know, I don't even want to touch this classical theist or this uh, theistic personalism stuff. Also, the, the the term theistic personalism, it's a pejorative. It's usually an insult. And so, like nobody who denies classical theism wants to typically wants to be like, yeah, 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 I'm a theistic personalist because then you're just asking to be insulted. So the 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 kind of taxonomy that I'm working with is 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 one that some others have, have worked with as well. And so. It goes a bit like this. So it says there's uh, what's called classical theism, which we just talked about. Then there's this neoclassical or modified classical theism. Then there's open theism, panentheism, and pantheism. Uh, and so I'll briefly explain what some of these are, and then I'll kind of unpack, I guess, what my own model of God is. So this neoclassical or this modified classical view, it says that God has exhaustive foreknowledge. So God does have an exhaustive foreknowledge of the future. But it's going to reject one or more of those four unique classical attributes we just talked about a minute ago. 
So it's going to reject either timelessness, simplicity, immutability, or impassibility, or maybe several of these or all of these. But it says that God knows the future. And this is, uh, you'll see people like this, like uh, Linda Zagzewski, uh, Thomas Morris, William Lane Craig, they all kind of fit into this category because they think that God knows the future, but they're going to deny one or more of these four classical attributes. Whereas when you look at open theism, open theism wants to say all four of those classical attributes, they're false. They, they just, you just can't have them. And you cannot have uh, an exhaustive foreknowledge either. So God cannot have an exhaustive foreknowledge of the future on open theism. The panentheist and the pantheist. Mm -hmm, go ahead. I, I, r question, real quick. Does Richard mm -hmm. Swinburne classify as an open theist? I would say so because he's going to deny all four of the classical attributes, and he's going to say God does not know the future. Uh, it's impossible to know what uh, creatures with libertarian freedom would do. So Swinburne's going to be in that category. Okay, and he embraces mm -hmm. libertarian free will. Yes. Yes. Okay. He does a few curious. other things, though. Yeah, so he does a few other things, though, that nobody else wants to follow. So he'll af affirm that God has auseity, like, so God's not um, caused to exist by anything outside of himself, but he'll deny that God's a necessary being. And most people want to go, no, nah, I, I want God to have a necessary existence. So Swinburne's kind of in his own little group over there with that. But, um, but other than that, open theists are pretty happy with everything else Swinburne's up to. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, so that's so that's open theism. Um, the two other models of God are panentheism and pantheism, and they're a bit difficult to pin down because some people in these camps, like they will affirm all four of the classical attributes, and some others will reject all four. Some of them say God's a person, some deny that God's a person. Uh, so for example, Arthur Peacock, he was a really prominent uh, 20th century um, panentheist. And so following, following like some versions of Thomism, Peacock says God's not a person, and he says God's not a being among other beings. Uh, so he'll make a lot of these different kind of claims. Uh, but what the the unique claims of these of these two models of God is their understanding of the God world relationship. So pantheism says that God in the universe, or maybe God in the multiverse, you know, whatever, how many ever universes you want to throw into existence, God is identical to those. So God's identical to the universe, or if there's a multiverse, God's identical to the multiverse. Whereas the panentheist wants to go, uh, the universe or multiverse is in God in some sort of metaphorical way or maybe a metaphysical way that I'm not going to tell you because they never tell me. But uh, they swear the, the, God, the, the universe is in God in some kind of interesting way. But what they will say that's really unique that most of the other models of God will want to deny is they'll say that God must create a universe of some sort. Uh, so God cannot exist without a universe or a multiverse. And that's something classical theism, the neoclassical and modified classical theist, and the open theist, they all want to deny. They all think God's free to create a universe or exist without a universe, whereas the panentheist is like, God has to create something. So that's kind of that view in a nutshell. Any questions on that before I get into my own model a little bit more? The question that I have is, can you define impassibility one, one more time for me? I'm, mm -hmm. I'm a little unclear yeah. on that one. Yeah, so, and this will it'll still help too when I start laying out what the neoclassical thesis is denying and affirming. So the impassibility, again, says God cannot suffer. That's like the first like typical claim within it. But the claim is stronger than that. It's that God cannot be influenced or moved or caused by anything outside of himself. And that God cannot have any emotions that are immoral, irrational, or unhappy. So, uh, so the claim is that God is perfectly happy, and that happiness is grounded entirely in himself. So mm -hmm. anything that you do, that can influence his happiness. Anything that you are cannot make him angry or make him do anything. He can't react because that would be to influence God, something external influencing God. So God cannot react. That's, that's like a really, that There's like a really basic question. I think a lot of Christians, mm -hmm. a lot of theists think that God created us because he's love. So mm -hmm. is this something like, how does that interact with this property? Oh, goodness. Um, yeah, so you'll see in Augustine and uh, same on like maybe like Herman Bavinck, they'll say all of God's love is self-love. It has to be. Um, and so any love that God has towards you, it's just because he loves his own excellence that he finds in you. Uh, there's nothing about you that could make him love you. There's nothing about you that's unique or, or distinct that could move him in one way or the other. So all, love, all of God's love has to be div like a divine self-love. Stephen, do you have anything to, to add on that? Do you, do you agree with that or disagree with that? I think it's, a, <clears throat> I think it's an interesting question. Um, first, we would have to ask the prior question whether and how it is coherent to talk about love, uh, granted the classical theistic point of view. Um, 
But let's let's just uh, consider the question for for a moment whether or not God can love us uh, only because He finds something of our ex of His excellence in us. Uh, if you take, for example, the doctrine of the the analogy of being, um, you know, finite being is analogous in some way as a reflection of participation, whatever, in the in the divine being and in, in the the infinite being of God. Uh, in that case, any finite just you know there is no distinction between God's excellence in me and what I am. Uh, so it really it's you know it it there would there, it's not like apart from God's excellence in in me I'm unlovable. I I think strictly speaking, if you adopt the analogy of being apart from God's excellence in me in virtue you know of my participation in His being, there's nothing left over that's just me. Everything that I am, everything that I am as a being, is a participation in God's being and therefore a reflection in some manner of His excellence. So I I would say that um, really, if you adopt the do- the doctrine of the analogy of being, then this idea that God only loves what is ex- you know His excellences that He sees excellencies that he sees in us, I think that idea is, is uh, really not that bad um, after all, because all we are is a reflection of God's excellence. Maybe we mm-hmm. should reserve some time to talk about the doctrine of analogy, because I, I'm, I'm kind of unclear on what it means and what it entails, and I don't... Anyways, well, maybe maybe we'll spend some, some time on that, but let's not get too far off track here. Let's mm-hmm. get back to... Uh, you were laying out all the, all the different rival conceptions of God to the classical approach, and uh, yeah, pick up where where we left off there. So, so I just yeah, so I laid out like these different views: this uh, neoclassical or modified classical view, this open theist view, panentheism, pantheism. Uh, and so, since I need to pick just a model of God for us to discuss, and so that way Stephen doesn't have like a moving target, um, I'm just going to go with like this modified classical or this neoclassical model of God. But um, like I said before, it's 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 you deny one or more of the four classical attributes. And I find that really sloppy. So I'm just going to deny all four of the classical attributes. So I'm going to deny timelessness, simplicity, mutability, and impassibility. You but when I do big. that, yeah, go big or go home, right? Like this is, you know, like the, what are we doing here? Uh, so yeah, so I want to go big or go home. And uh, when I do that, though, I have to replace them with four other attributes. And so those four attributes that I replace them with are temporality, mutability, passability, and unity. Uh, and so then I'll define those and then we can get on. Um, so to say that God is a unified essence, like it just means that uh, all of his essential properties uh, or attributes, they're necessarily coextensive. Uh, so his essential attributes like aseity, knowledge, power, freedom, goodness, you know, whatever you want to throw in there, like they don't contradict each other. And you're not going to find them floating free from God. You're not going to find God existing without his goodness or existing without his uh, you know, power or something of the sort like that. So because these are essential attributes. And since they're essential, it's impossible to lose them. So that's not even, there shouldn't even be a worry on this model of God. It's, it's not possible to lose essential attributes by definition. So that's what it means to say God is, is a unity. Uh, to say that God is temporal, uh, when I say that God's temporal, uh, I'm not denying that God is eternal. Because to say that God is eternal is just to say that God exists without beginning and without end. And you get that from necessary existence. So you just get, from necessary existence, you get eternity for free. But to say that God is temporal, what I mean is that God does have succession in his life. God does do, does do one thing and then another. So, uh, so for example, like God wasn't always creating the universe, and then he creates the universe. And so those are new moments in the life of God. So he's got succession in his life. What that entails is that God is mutable, which means that God can undergo intrinsic or extrinsic change. So God can't change his essence, like I said before, because that's just impossible. But God can undergo like non-essential or accidental changes. So, uh, like you know, I, like I mentioned a minute ago, when God freely exercises His omnipotence to create a universe, He goes from not creating anything to creating something. He goes from not being the creator to being the creator, and so He changes in those ways. And then um, the the final attribute is is passability. So impassibility said so God can't suffer. God can't be caused or moved or influenced by anything outside of Himself. Uh, passability says. God can have a whole range of emotions that are consistent with his perfect rationality and his perfect goodness. And God can be moved or influenced by things outside of himself. So if he sees Stephen like uh, committing certain sins, God's going to get angry. If he sees Stephen like uh, repenting, God's going to be like, all right, we're cool now. We're good. You know, so God's going to like be influenced by things that Stephen is doing in the world. He's not influenced by me because, you know, God doesn't care about me, but he really cares about Stephen a lot. So he's going to be like, you know, uh, reacting to what's going on in Stephen's life. So that's kind of my model of God in a nutshell. And so, and it also affirms again that like God has some sort of exhaustive uh, foreknowledge of the future uh, because it's not open theistic. It's this modified classical theistic view. 
So here's one thing that I've heard Dr. Ed Fazer say. I was listening to a lecture that he gave at some, some I can't remember exactly where he was giving it, but I think it was about a year ago he, he gave it. And uh, in the talk, he was saying that simplicity, the doctrine of simplicity is the only way to get a monotheistic worldview or, or something along those lines. It's the, it's the only way that we can rule out polytheism. Do you have any thoughts on that, Ryan? Yeah, um, I need to think of something. Are you, nice are you familiar to say, with that argument? Yeah, uh, I, I think it's a bald assertion that you cannot back up or justify. Um, it's, I, yeah, I don't know what the argument could possibly be for a conclusion like that. That would not be question begging. That's that's the worry I have. Any any thoughts on that, Stephen? Is that is that an argument that you like or are fond of? I would think so. Um, I think that given the way that Ryan has defined God, um, really those four attributes that he talks about, those apply to any finite being at all. Um, the only difference is that some of them don't always exist. Uh, but everything is a unity. Everything is uh, temporal. Everything is uh, passable in various ways. Uh, and everything you know, undergoes changes all the time. Uh, so I, I think that what Ryan's model does is effectively to make God a being like the rest of us. Um, and the difficulty arises in the fact that, you know, because he is a being, well, any, you know, for any kind of being, there could be two of them. Uh, so in principle, there could be two of these kinds of beings, just like there can be two human beings or two cats or two dogs. Um, whereas, on the other hand, given the definition that divine simplicity supplies of God, there could not possibly be two absolutely simple, undifferentiated pure realities, right? There, there's, no, there's no room for... Uh, multiplicity given that definition. So I think that's what Fazer is getting at. Uh, he says that the classical theistic definition of God defines God or conceives of God in such a way that there could not possibly be more than one. Uh, whereas if you conceive of God as a being, again, because of the, you know, the, the nature of universals in particular, any, any particular being, there could be another one of that kind. Uh, and this is an argument that, if I'm not mistaken, uh, Louis Ayers, I think, if not somebody else, or, um, makes in a in a question in a paper on Thomas Aquinas uh, and his um, and his uh, doctrine of God. I I don't think it's quite Lewis Ayers, but I I am, am I don't know exactly who it is. But he makes that same point. God couldn't possibly be a thing like the rest of us because for any kind of thing there could be two of them. So it's the it's the same argument. I, I guess I don't see why that's the case. That's that's the worry I have. I don't see just because it's he's a being, there could be more kinds of him. Um, especially when you reflect on what kind of being he is. So there's a whole long tradition in the classical tradition itself saying there can't be more than one omnipotent being. There can't be more than one omniscient being. Uh, and then you do this for any in, any individual divine attribute. It seems like if you're not a classical theist, you could just buy into all those same exact arguments. I don't see like just why in principle there could be more than one. I would say because any particular being is a composite of a principle of intelligibility and a principle of individuation, right? On the one hand, or we can talk about essence and existence or, or mm -hmm. form and matter, right? Uh, there's there's what the thing is, and then there's that which makes the thing to be particular. Mm -hmm. uh, but what the thing is, its suchness, you might say, is intrinsically uh, of the nature that it can be multiply instantiated, right? Suchness is general, and so just like there, you know, there's humanity in general, because humanity in general, you know, is a general thing, there can be multiple human beings. There's no intrinsic particularity, there's no intrinsic individuation in the, in the essence, in the nature. Uh, and that's why, for example, for any kind of being, because every finite being is a composite of nature and, uh, you know, ipsaity or whatever you want to say, mm -hmm. uh, because the nature is general, therefore it can be repeated across multiple individuals. Anything to mm -hmm. add on that, Ryan? Or, I, um, I, I don't want to get too deep yeah. into a debate because that's yeah. not what the point, the point of this is not to, right. to go back and forth too much, but I think it is important to like, to have some dialogue and, and maybe some, some disagreement here and there mm -hmm. just to show that there's like, you know, the, the reason why this kind of stuff is important. So if, if would, you have anything to add, feel free, but if not, we can move along. Yeah. Stephen, what were you, what were you thinking? I want to make just one more point. I think mm -hmm. in Richard Swinburne's doctrine of the Trinity, you also have three omnipotent mm -hmm. and omniscient beings, right? Yeah. So at least, you know, for Richard Swinburne, there doesn't seem to be an impossibility in talking about three omnipotences or three uh, omnipotent beings. Yeah, that's certainly true. So like Swinburne's view, if it's not tritheism, 
you know, it's uh, it's pretty close. Um, yeah, no, I think that's right. But if you do buy into any of those arguments for why you think maybe you can't have more than one uh, omnipotent being or you can't have more than one omniscient being or something of the sort like that. Uh, so again, like very standard uh, classical arguments, then you can easily apply those to any non-classical model of God that affirms one of those attributes like omnipotence, omniscience or something of the sort. Um, or you could just go Swinburne and be like, Meh, you could have multiple ones. So I think that yeah, I think it kind of yeah, it depends on your doctrine of the Trinity, um, which we're not talking about today. I know, but yeah, no, that that seems fair. Mm-hmm. So I think that we've done a good job of kind of differentiating between the different concepts of God that are sort of on the table here, and we're looking at the classical conception from Stephen, and now the modified classical conception. I appreciate you laying out those four properties and then saying, well, what you're going to say is that God is mutable, passable, temporal, and He's a uh, unit or unity how, a how unity say that? unified he's, mm-hmm. he's a unit okay he's unified and by that just to be clear you're saying that he just has a set of essential attributes mm-hmm. that's, yeah that's so not what it sounds like you're saying yeah and so that's i mean that's what most people like al ghazali or some contemporary thinkers like john uh, john feinberg when they are looking at this claim they're like we can't have simplicity for various reasons uh so we need something else we need to say god's somehow unified his attributes are uh, they're essential attributes. They're not in conflict with one another. You're not going to find them existing apart from God. But they are coextensive. But they're coextensive, yeah. Okay, well, let's move on to the next uh, next thing. So what is the role of philosophical reasoning in each of these views? So how much can we know about God as a person through philosophy? So, Stephen, Stephen, would you, you want like to start? Yeah, let me start. Uh, so then Ryan can refute what I say. Uh I think that this is my interpretation. I think that classical theism is a philosophical doctrine of God. Um, It is a doctrine of God that, in my own opinion, cannot really convincingly be justified on the basis of Scripture. I think that it's it's an understanding of God to which you arrive through philosophical reflection on the conditions of finite being. Um, How much can we know about God philosophically? That's a very good question. Um, my own opinion is that you cannot know very much at all about God philosophically in the absence of special revelation. Uh, I think of a, a passage from John of Damascus in which he says that uh, we can know that God exists and that he's the cause of everything, but what he is in nature and essence is totally unknown. Uh, and in, far, in, you know, in, in fact, he is so different from finite beings with which we're familiar that it's better to think of him in total abstraction from everything created. Right? We can't think of him on, you know, in the same terms that we think about finite beings, uh, and certainly not like ourselves. So this implies that God's personality, if we can talk about a personality of God, is going to be radically, radically different from our own. Uh, He does not have multiple thoughts. He does not have multiple desires or interests. He does not make choices in time. He does not have uh, a process of deliberation. Uh, All of that stuff has to go, because again, God is not like us. He doesn't have uh, a composite being. He doesn't have uh, attention or consciousness in the way that we do, where we have to think about one thing and then see the connections between ideas and all this. We have to think about God as being radically different from us. Uh, so that means that uh, purely philosophically, in the absence of special revelation, uh, what we can say about God as a person is very limited. Maybe God has some kind of consciousness or awareness or life um, in virtue of which he can create things. I don't think that classical theism conceives of God as like a rock. Uh, he's not impersonal. He's he's uh, rather than being subpersonal, I would say that he is super personal. He's beyond the personal as we understand it and as we experience it in ourselves. Uh, but what God is, who can know? Uh, this also means that in the absence of special revelation, in the absence of the incarnation of Christ, especially, we cannot know why God has created the world, what He's aiming at, what is the point of everything, where is everything headed. Uh, you know, these things remain perpetual mysteries. We can know that God exists because the contingent finite world exists and it needs to be caused to exist by God. But why does it exist and where is it headed? What is the point of it all? What is the explanation for the things that happen in history? In the absence of special revelation, there are no answers to these questions. We're just left with mysteries and things that we can't know. So this view that you just articulated, Stephen, strikes me as a, a incoherent in some way. And the, the reason why... <laughs> the reason why it it does that to me is because it's when we when we make a claim like we can't know what God is like, you're claiming that you knew you know something, you know that you can't know what He's like, so you know something about God. So it almost it almost like uh, shoots itself in the foot to me. Yeah, I I, um, 
I'm familiar with this line of objection, and I think Ryan also uh, raised it once with me when we were hanging out in uh, Temple City. Remember, mm-hmm. after LATC 2018, we were hanging yeah. out mine and JT's place. Uh, every time I do a podcast, I have to do a shout out to JT because, you know, I love him so much. <laughs> yeah. um, I would say this. The statement that God is unknowable is really the statement that God is unknowable to us. Um, it's, it's more about us and about an awareness that we have of our own limits of understanding uh, than about God and himself. So, for example, suppose I try to lift, you know, suppose I'm, I'm at the gym and I'm lifting weights and I try to deadlift, you know, some amount of weight. Um, let's say I have 405 pounds on the bar. I can't deadlift that much. Uh, and so after trying and failing, I say this is unliftable. You know, on the surface of it, it looks like I'm making a statement about the bar and the weights themselves. They're unliftable. But really what I mean is that they're unliftable for me. And I can tell that I can't lift them when I try. Um, I'm not saying something so much about the weights as I am about myself. And in the same way, once we get a clear understanding of what God is, once we see the relationship uh, that God stands in to finite beings, uh, then we can also understand, we can sense that, okay, this is beyond my understanding. I can't get at what this is in itself. I only have access to it from the outside through its relation to finite beings. Uh, So again, it's more of a statement about ourselves. I think you're right that it entails that I have some kind of contact with God. I, I'm, in, I'm in contact with him somehow, cognitively, uh, but that's a contact that reveals to me my inability to understand him. So there's a contact, but it's not like a kind of a grasping. It's not like the contact that I have with the number two. I understand the number two, uh, and I, I grasp it with my mind, and I can you know, reason uh, truly about the number two. With God, it's different. I can grasp God with my mind. I can see that he is there, you know, that he is there as the cause of things, but I, simultaneously, I'm aware that what he is in himself, apart from the fact that he causes things, I have no idea and I can't get to it. All right. So I want to pull Ryan in here. And I, mm-hmm. man, I want to interact with you a little bit more on this. Is there, so do you know, uh, is God a dog? No. I, well, what is, I don't know what this is. Okay. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm, uh, this is a question for Steven. So I, I, oh, what, okay. I'm, what, I'm, what I'm kind of getting at is that I think that we can know that God, what God is not. So we say God is not a dog. God is not a prime number. So we have some knowledge about God just on the basis of what God isn't. Would you agree with Mm -hmm. that? Yeah, certainly. Okay. So we can have some knowledge. And I think we could even like through entailment, through, through some arguments, we could figure out that like, if God is not this and he's not this, then he's also not this. And so we could, we could gain a pretty substantial amount of knowledge about God just through sort of what God isn't. I agree that it's okay. I agree that we have negative knowledge or we, we have knowledge of what God is not, right? We can just like clear the table very quickly because God is not, you know, metaphysically composed in various ways. He is no finite being of any kind whatsoever. Um, I would go even further. I would say that God is not even a particular being because in order to be a particular, you have to have a composite of intelligibility and individuation. So God is not even a particular being. Um, but again, once I recognize that negative knowledge, I mean, once I know that God is not a particular being, um, I quickly realize that I have no grasp because the only thing that my mind can grasp really are objects, particulars. Um, this is a, this is a point, uh, that is made very clearly in Husserl's phenomenology. You know, consciousness, uh, constitutes objects, the things that we think about and the things that we have uh, a grasp of are always objects, particular things. Uh, that have a suchness about them. They're particular, and yet they have various qualities that we can grasp. Once I deny that God is a particular with various qualities, I realize that I can't grasp him. I can't, um, you know, I can't uh, know what he is. Uh, it's true that I can know what he's not, uh, but at the same time, the fact that I can't know what he is uh, also entails that in the absence of special revelation, once more, I can't know why he created the world. I can't know where everything is headed. I can't know why the various things that happened to me in my life have taken place, etc. So a lot of these questions, you know, regarding like the meaning of our life uh, and the direction of history and where things are going, if it's going anywhere, a lot of these questions simply cannot be answered philosophically uh, by reference to God. There, there would be need of special revelation for God to come and to tell us and to provide us with a language for talking and for thinking about these things. I right, agree so with you right. that we. Yeah. So I agree with you that there are a lot of things about God that we can know that He's not. Uh, but the really meaty, essential question is, what is he? And that's where I think philosophically we cannot know. Mm-hmm. Ryan, where would you like to... Do, what, are, what are your thoughts? Well, I'm still worried that, that Stephen knows too much. Um, 
So if I want to say God's not this, God's not that, um, you know, I don't want to. I want to say God's not a murderer. God's, you know, not uh, not a dog. Uh, well, why is he not a murderer? Why is he not a dog? Well, it's because of positive claims I want to make about God. Um, God's not a dog because, well, he's an immaterial thing, and dogs are material things. He doesn't have a canine DNA. Um, why? Because he's a non-physical substance, something like that. Uh, but, you know, if I can't say that, I can't even say that God exists, because I have to say he's, because that would be to say God's like a particular being. I have to say God's beyond existence. So... But again, if I say God's beyond existence, well, A, I don't really know what that means because um, I, I feel like my atheist friends are going to be like, yeah, that's right. You know, God's beyond existence. Um, but if I want to say, no, 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 it's not atheism, I swear, then it still feels like I'm making some kind of claim that I shouldn't be knowing if God's really unknowable in this sort of way. Even the claim that given the kind of thing that I am, I cannot know anything about God. I still know too much there. Because I know enough about God and I know enough about the kind of thing that I am to make that assertion. And so I'm contradicting myself. So it's, it's, these are, yeah, I guess I've got to worry still in the same neighborhood. Would you like I really to, don't to comment see, on that, Simi? Yeah, I really, I mean, I don't see it as a problem. I, I'm not denying that we have some kind of grasp of God with our minds. Uh, but I'm saying that this grasp is of such a nature that we can't go beyond that. We can know that God is that which causes everything. Um, and that which sustains the existence of everything. Um, <clears throat> but beyond that, you know, we don't have a, we don't have anything to hold on to. We have no other access to it. Uh, mm. This is, this is the limited access that we have. So I'm not denying that we have any kind of cognitive grasp of okay. God at all. Yeah. There's a kind of a non-possessive, you know, I'll, I'll use the term that DC Schindler uses uh, in his book, The Catholicity of Reason. There's a kind of a non-possessive grasp uh, where we, we have a sort of a sense and a hold on the thing but without understanding it and without knowing what it is and without being able to say what it is in itself. Okay, so it's not a full-blown apophaticism. Um, I mean, what, what constitutes a full-blown apophaticism? Obviously, I don't think that God is nothing, yeah. uh, but I would say that God is no thing. He's not a, a thing. He's not, like a, he, he, you know, he's not subject to the conditions of thingness, uh, but he's not nothing either. He's something that is beyond thingness. Mm -hmm. All right, yeah. well, let's switch. I mean, you, you know, to, I uh, don't know what that means, but yeah, that's fine. <laughs> yeah, no, I think that, uh, I mean, th maybe, maybe we're just like wetting people's appetites for, uh, for round sure. two for the, for yeah, part yeah. two, where we're going to get into a lot more disagreement and sort of mm -hmm. some of the rival arguments for and against and everything. And even on simplicity, like some, uh, in the same lecture that I was listening to this morning from Ed Fazer, he was saying that simplicity is like, it's supposed to be simple, but it's like the most complex doctrine that exists. Mm -hmm. And so there's, there's a whole lot to discuss. Here. And so it's uh, it's I'm, I'm really excited about part two, but uh, let, let's move on to uh, well, first, let me let you guys know the audience that we are going to do some Q&A. And I don't think I mentioned that at the beginning, but we're going to move to Q&A. So I already had someone send in a super chat and we'll get to that in about 45 minutes from now. So the whole show is going to be about two hours. We're 45 minutes in now. So we'll go for another 45 minutes of discussion and then we'll do 30 minutes of live Q&A. So if you have a question for Stephen or for Dr. Mullins, I don't know why I did that. If you have a question for Ryan or Steven, uh, just write it in the live chat or send it as a, as a super chat. That is the absolute best way to make sure that your question will be asked and answered today. So, uh, well, let's move on to talk about the role of the, of the Bible in these competing views of God. So how does the Bible's language about God as a, as person sort of factor in here? Let's start with you, Ryan. Yeah, so I think when you look at Scripture, you get a very different conception of God from that of classical theism, and that's really not too controversial of a statement. So I was presenting a paper uh, last year at the University of St. Andrews, and there was a biblical scholar in the room, and I was you know, looking at uh, the classical theistic tradition, and she asked me, she's like, why are you even considering the classical like, like model of God? Like in biblical studies, we think that's just silly. And, and like, I mean, like, I thought that was pretty funny, uh, but I was like, well, because, you know, like the majority of Christians throughout history have thought that. She's just like, oh, okay. And yeah, I guess if you want to do that, that's fine. Um, so it's not uncontroversial in biblical studies to say this sort of stuff. So to give you some more examples, like uh, the Old Testament scholar, Walter Brueggemann, uh, he says that classical theism is in direct tension with the biblical witness. And then Terence Freedom, like he's written a great deal uh, uh, on just Old Testament themes of divine suffering and change. And these are like major, major themes throughout scripture. 
Uh, and that directly contradicts the attributes of like timelessness, immutability, simplicity, and passability. Because if God's changing, he's going to have accidental properties. So he's not going to be timeless. He's not going to be simple. He's not going to be immutable. And then if he's suffering, then he's not going to be impassable. Uh, and this is something like open theists have been pointing out for several decades now, just saying that like when you look at the biblical accounts, they are just radically different from the classical model of God. And this is not really surprising because the classical theistic tradition, like, I mean, they had a major prolegomena throughout the Western tradition. And the the, the issue was this, they just had this, this question of like, why does the Bible not speak of God in terms of timelessness, simplicity, immutability, and impassibility? So like Pseudo Dionysius and St. Augustine, they have this question of just like, they're like, look, all the terms in scripture for eternity are temporal terms. What do we do with that? When you look at uh, other thinkers like Stephen Sharnick and um, uh, Louis Burkhoff, they're like, you're not going to get immutability from the biblical claims. We have to, to bring in philosophical arguments for that sort of stuff. You're just not going to find it. Uh, there's a contemporary thinker named John Peckham, and he's done a lot of work on biblical accounts of divine love. And in my mind, he has decisively demonstrated that the biblical portrayal of God looks something quite like this neoclassical or modified classical theism. Because the Bible describes God in these very deeply like personal and compassionate terms. Because it says this is a God who is emotionally moved by his creatures and who responds to his creatures with empathy and compassion. And that's just not the classical image here. Uh, let me just give you just, I guess, uh, uh, two different uh, examples in scripture where you see this sort of stuff. So Jeremiah 18. Jeremiah 18 says that God will relent or will change his plans if people repent. So this is a God who is willing to interact with his people based on what they do. And so he's a responsive God. And a lot of Old Testament scholars, they really hit on this theme very hard. They say that's like the major biblical understanding of God is see, this is a God who is responsive to his creatures in some sort of consistent uh, and moral way. And then you see this really heightened when you look at Hosea chapter 11. Hosea chapter 11 like the build up to that chapter is God saying he's really mad at his people and he's going to lay out this plan of wrath on them. But then God kind of has this back and forth uh, in, in Hosea 11. And it says that because God is not a stubborn man who lacks compassion, that is the very reason why God will change his plan of wrath to a plan of mercy. Precisely because God is not a man, he will change. He's not stubborn. He is compassionate. That's a very different kind of understanding of God that you don't find in classical theism. So I think the biblical portrayal of God is very, very different from the classical model of God. What are, what are your thoughts, Stephen? I'm inclined to agree with everything that uh, Ryan says. I don't think that classical theism is, um, you know, the picture that you get in the Bible about God. Um, Nevertheless, I am a classical theist, so I would have to address the question, okay, well, how do you justify your philosophical doctrine of God with the depiction of God in the Bible? Um, I go back to what Dionysius the Areopagite says, I think, in the divine names, if not in the mystical theology. Uh, he says that because God, as absolutely simple, is beyond our capacities to understand and to talk about, you know, with respect to what he is intrinsically, Therefore, there is the need of divine revelation so that we can be given a language and a way of grasping, a way of understanding really what, how it is that we do and ought to relate to God. Uh, so I tend to think of the biblical presentation of God as um, a way of speaking and a way of thinking about God, which produces, you know, if it's re received in faith, produces the effect of a life, you know, of the sort that God wants from us. Uh, so, for example, when we sin, we are told that God is angry at sin uh, because that, you know, that, you know, we relate to anger uh, in such a way that we turn from our sins. Or, for example, when we're, you know, downcast or when we're feeling guilty, uh, God uh, is presented to us as loving and as forgiving us uh, so that we don't stay in that state forever, but that we stand up and in confidence before God, we go on and live our lives in repentance. Um, I think that the biblical language is used more for the sake of its effect, for the sake of the life that it produces, than for the sake of producing or for the sake of offering a metaphysically adequate depiction of how God relates to us. Um, I think there's no really avoiding this uh, conclusion. If you accept the classical theistic you know, picture about God, you cannot say that God changed his mind about destroying the Israelites after the episode with the golden calf. You cannot say, for example, that... Um, 
you know, God didn't know that Moses was going to intercede. Uh, you have to interpret all these things uh, differently. You have to think that the point is not so much to present a metaphysically adequate picture of God and his relation to the world, but to give us some way of thinking about God and some way of relating to him and, and uh, talking about him that produces a faithful life of the sort that God wants human beings to live. Any thoughts on that, Ryan? Yeah, so so William Hasker has this sort of argument, um, and I guess I'll just run it by you and see what you, what you, what you think, Stephen. So um, you'll see people like uh, John Calvin, uh, John Chrysostom, and a whole you know bunch of different people in the classical tradition. They'll say exactly kind of like the sort of claim that you just made, which is you know God doesn't really present himself; he presents himself in a particular way in order to get some kind of reaction out of us, uh, and that and in that way he's drawing us closer to him. And so Hasker uh, looks at the biblical passages and he's like, okay, so in the biblical passages we see claims like God is indignant at sin every single day, uh, and that's supposed to help us draw closer to God. Well, it turns out that God is not indignant at sin in, uh, every single day, and it turns out actually that God is in a state of pure, undisturbed happiness every single day. Um, so what the Bible is telling us is not even remotely close to what God's like. Instead, God's the exact opposite of, of that. Now, if I get to heaven uh, and I'm like thinking I'm drawing closer to this being that's got, you know, this empathy, this compassion, uh, that gets angry, angry um, at, at sin, and then I get there and it turns out God's nothing like that whatsoever, I might think I've been duped, right? Uh, I might think, hang on, like I thought God was like this, and it turns out God's completely different. Uh, he's the exact opposite. He's nothing remotely like what, what the Bible described. I, it seems like something really deceitful has happened here. Like uh, I don't know. Like what do, what do you, I guess? Like what do you think of that kind of objection from Hasker? Um, I would perhaps propose an analogy to mathematics or to science. Uh, I don't know hardly anything about mathematics and science. I'm sure that you know more than me. So I think the, well, I'm the terrible at math. Yeah. Well, in any case, let's try it. Um, you know, you're told things as you're growing up about mathematics uh, or about science uh, mm -hmm. that later on you learn are not strictly true. They're useful as an introduction into the topic, uh, but later when you um, understand things more clearly and you have a greater and more sophisticated grasp on the subject matter, you find out that the earlier discussion is not perfectly adequate. Uh, and so you can think, for example, of the model of the atom, right, with the electrons flying around a nucleus. Mm -hmm. From what I understand, that's not actually what atoms are like. Right. Uh, yeah. But it's, it's useful um, because it helps to give a picture. It helps to give us something to work with and we can move beyond it once it's, you know, its usefulness is exhausted. Um, I think that the Bible is not written, you know, with philosophers in mind. Mm -hmm. It's written for, you know, hoi polloi, to use an elitist phrase. It's written for everyday people. Um, and it's written for people who, you know, are living their life in the world and uh, with whom God, you know, is a, is a topic of, of interest and of concern. So I think that it uses that language as a way for maximizing um, communicative scope or effect. Uh, but that doesn't mean that you couldn't possibly go beyond it, uh, even while granting the initial, um, uh, the initial usefulness of it. And I would also suggest that the various uh, ways of speaking that the Bible describes can be understood perhaps in a more metaphysical way, um, but imminently to the created order. So, for example, I would say that God's anger against sin is not anger in him, like a mental state. I would say that God's anger against sin uh, is expressed in the fact that sinful people don't get away with it forever. They're eventually punished. Um, so the anger of God really takes place in the world. It's not in him. Uh, but, of course, because he's the cause of the world, uh, we say that he's angry in the sense that he eventually you know, punishes sinners. Or likewise, God's grace. God's grace towards us um, is not like a, a nice feeling of kindness inside of God. Uh, it's the fact that God produces this effect. He takes sinners and he justifies them. Um, or he forgives sinners. Or he is kind to people who uh, don't deserve it. Um, and so also God's goodness. God doesn't have goodness of heart like we do. For example, I feel a goodness in me, and then out of that goodness I do something kind to somebody. Uh, God is not like me. Uh, but God's goodness consists in the fact that everything that God does, everything that God causes is aimed at our ultimate good and what God is pursuing, so to speak, in, in the production and the, you know, sustaining of, in being of the world over time is our well-being. Uh, so I would say that the divine, the biblical language is useful as an initiation into the life with God, 
And then later, if you develop a, you know, if you accede to the thought of classical theism, if you uh, if you develop a more metaphysically sophisticated notion of uh, uh, that's that's pejorative, if, if you if you develop a different conception of God, which requires you to reinterpret the biblical language, you will find, I think, that it's more a reference to the way things happen in the world as a result of God than a reference to things that you know uh, are taking place within God uh, and you know in His inner life. Mm-hmm. Stephen, does the doctrine of analogy help you out here as well? With the with the biblical data, you know, I don't know. Um, I'm I'm really sort of unconvinced about the doctrine of analogy. Uh, so people will typically say, for example, that God is not angry like we are, but there is in God something like anger. Uh, and then the question arises: Okay, well, what is that thing? Um, either you can't tell me at all because what God is intrinsically you don't know, or else you will have to define the analogy in terms of the effect that God produces. Like I was saying, you know, just like when I'm angry, I you know, act destructively, let's say. Uh, so also, God's anger refers to the fact that sometimes he causes things to be destroyed um, as a result of, you know, what has happened previously. Uh, so, again, the analogy, I mean, you can really reduce it to a, to a univocal use of the word anger with respect to the effect produced. Uh, just like my anger, you know, is expressed in the fact that um, I destroy things, let's say. So also God's anger is expressed in the fact that sinners are destroyed as a result of their sin. But without saying anything about what God is like on the inside, uh, in his inner life, because again, this is inaccessible to us. Ryan, anything else to say on the topic of the Bible? Uh, yeah, so when we're looking at um, some of these claims like uh, that Stephen's pointing towards in within like science, so within philosophy of science, uh, I, I, what I'm doing is I'm taking an anti-realist approach to different theories. So, for example, uh, space-time is a is, you know it's, it's a pretty big deal in special theory of relativity, but it turns out we know special theory of relativity is false. So, a bunch of physicists today are just like, let's just get rid of space-time. Uh, so, I was at a talk at the Higgs Center for Theoretical Physics uh, last semester, and a physicist got up there and he's like, we all know space-time is a, a fiction. It's not even useful anymore. It's dead. Let's move on. Uh, and no one in the room other than myself was shocked because everybody else in the room, they're like hard-nosed physicists. And they're like, yeah, of course. Uh, so if I took an approach like that and tried to say, I've got this fiction that's supposed to be useful um, that I'm getting from scripture, I feel like I'm having an anti-realist approach to to God. Uh, and so that that that's a worry I guess I have. Um, but you might come try to push back and be like, no, like it's still, it's not like a fully anti-realist approach because I'm still saying that there is a God who like causes things and that's like going on in scripture. But the amount of reinterpretation I have to do, I guess I want to push back and say it's really staggering. So Terence Freedom, who's an Old Testament scholar, he'll point out that there are a lot of like metaphors and a lot of figurative language going on in, in, this, in the Bible. But you have to interpret it with the grain of the metaphor instead of against the grain of the metaphor. Uh, and so when you're taking like a classical theistic and in, in reinterpretation of scripture or just interpretation of scripture, you're really going against the grain of all of these metaphors. Uh, so let me stick with just wrath. In the Old Testament alone, divine wrath is described over 400 times, and then even more so in the New Testament. And so you have to explain away all 400 of those verses that describe God's wrath in very emotional terms, in very reactive and responsive terms. And you have to say, God's wrath doesn't mean anything like these emotions in all 400 of these passages. It doesn't mean anything like reaction or responsiveness in all 400 of these passages. And so there's a lot of scripture to explain away. Uh, and so I feel like... That is a cost, a very heavy cost for the classical theist. That you have to explain away a lot of scripture. Stephen, um, I, I think that this uh, hermeneutical question is an interesting one, but it's really a matter of how you think it's appropriate to read the Bible. Mm-hmm. Um, if you think that it's only appropriate to read the Bible on you know its own terms, um, and you don't also think that you can have some kind of philosophical knowledge of what God is apart from the context of the content of the Bible, uh, naturally you're going to feel differently about classical theism and about proposed, proposed classical theistic reinterpretations of these relevant texts. Um, I don't start from that assumption. I think that uh, the classical theism is true. I think that it can be shown to be true philosophically. Uh, so for me, the context is different. Um, Within this context of a philosophically established, you know, uh, classical theism, then we have the Bible, which as Christians we take to be inspired and to, uh, to be the word of God. The question then arises, okay, how do I interpret the Bible in light of these other facts, which I also know to be true, or which I take myself to know to be true? Um, 
And then I can make this distinction between what the Bible says and the way that it would be understood, um, you know, by the average person who is not a classical theist, let's say, or by the original authors or the intended audience, et cetera, to the extent that I have access to that sort of thing. Um, what actually happens, you know, behind the scenes, uh, and then the relationship between the, the behind the scenes realities and the presentation of those realities in the text. Uh, I, I want to be clear that I'm not saying that the Bible is false or that what the Bible mm. says is not true. That's, that would be a gross misinterpretation of what I'm saying. I, obviously, I do not deny that, you know, what the Bible teaches. It's the Word of God, and it teaches us how to think and to, to speak about God. What I'm denying is that the Bible, the Bible's presentation of God is, um, you know, always metaphysically accurate or always metaphysically appropriate. Um, you know, by, God speaks to us in human language, and human language is, has its own limits and its own, uh, you know, uh, boundaries. It, we can only talk uh, in so many ways about so many things. So God speaks to us on our own terms and our own language in a way that we'll understand. But it doesn't follow that that's like a metaphysically adequate picture of what is actually going on. It just has to be enough so that we understand the point and respond accordingly. All right, well, let's move on to uh, one of the last things that we're going to talk about before we move to Q&A, which is how does the difference between the classical theistic and the theistic personalist conceptions or the classical, the neoclassical, the modified classical conceptions, how do these play out in other religions? And so while we were answering that, I'm also curious, does classical theism or does the modified classical approach jive with Roman Catholicism or do you have to be a classical theist in order to to be a, a Roman Catholic or yeah what what's let's talk about all of it Ryan I saw you nodding your head so let's start with well, you because um because I have several friends who are Catholic uh, that are outside of America okay so the Catholics in America a lot of them that are doing Christian philosophy most of them are converts to Catholicism later on and their understanding of Catholicism is really different than um, a lot of my friends in Europe uh, who, are, who are Catholics and I just find that very funny uh, and so some of my friends who are Catholics in different European countries, all, some of them are open theists and they're just like, yeah, yeah, no big deal. Uh, there's ways I can talk that make me sound like I am still affirming um, various statements within Vatican II or whatnot. Whereas I, if I really look at a lot of the different like uh, creedal and, and doctrinal statements within the Catholic canon, like it looks like you got to affirm simplicity. You got to affirm timelessness. You got to affirm the entire classical package. Um, but yeah, I know a bunch of uh, Catholic theologians who are just like, meh, meh. I don't care. I would Stephen. say that. Um, so I would make two points. I agree. I think that classical theism is more or less the view of God that is suggested and required by Roman Catholicism. Edward Fazer makes this point. He says that the doctrine of divine simplicity is de fide. It was defined as an essential part of the faith. I mm -hmm. forget at which, you know, councils. Um, I think it was Lateran IV, and then yeah. um, I think Vatican I maybe as well. Yeah, like it's, it's, exactly. Yeah, I can't remember. Uh, so, you know, and, and really, once you have divine simplicity, you have the rest of it. Mm -hmm. uh, so the divine simplicity is really the most important doctrine. Um, I would also make the point that, you know, classical reformed theology is also uh, classically theistic in a lot of ways, right? Uh, the Westminster Confession affirms the simplicity of God and various other uh, theologians in the reformed tradition on the continent and elsewhere affirm the doctrine of divine simplicity in the classical theistic position more generally. And this is, again, because they're inheritors of Thomas Aquinas. Uh, so I think that that you know it's it's uh, not just Catholicism, uh, not just uh, Protestantism. Even in Eastern Orthodoxy, if you read John of Damascus, uh, you know Eastern Orthodoxy develops a little bit perhaps with um, uh, Gregory Palamas and others later on. But if you read John of Damascus, he is very much a hardcore classical theist. You know, um, as committed and as hardcore as the rest of them. Um, I, I want to ask you a question, Cameron. So, is this? So, we talked about classical theism in other religions. Is the is the and we're both Christians. We're both Protestants. Is the suggestion that Roman Catholicism is another religion, or is that just a, a sort of an entry into the the topic? It's an entry into the topic. I wasn't <laughs> suggesting that it was a that it was another religion at all. Okay, no, I think okay. that I think that classical theists can be Protestants, but I'm not sure that Catholics can be something other than classical theists. So that's that's my yeah. that's my question there, and and then it can go into a, a broader conversation about other religions. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that okay. was that was the the question that yeah. I had because <laughs> I'm not really sure what I'm, I'm still doing my my own research on Catholicism and everything. Ryan, are you are you Protestant or Catholic? Yeah, I'm vaguely Protestant. Yeah. Vaguely pro. Okay. 
Well, uh, yeah. Do you have, do you have any thoughts on that before we broaden it up to other religions? Yes. So as Stephen points out, like the, the, a lot of the Protestant traditions in their, in their confessional statements, they do seem to allude to classical attributes. The problem is they don't define any of the things in their, in their, um, in, in like their different confessions and creeds, uh, with regards to the doctrine of God. And in fact, like I'm strongly tempted to say that like, the doctrine of God is the thing they cared the least about because they don't have anywhere near as much to say about that as they do like other uh, doctrines. So there's some sort of statement, God doesn't have parts. And I'm like, well, I can affirm that um, because I don't buy into the Thomistic understanding of parts. <sighs> they say God doesn't have passions. I'm like, well, yeah, but that's because you can draw this nice distinction between emotions and passions. And so I can, you know, there's things I can, moves I can make, but my denomination, we don't have uh, any creeds or or confessions, so I can just kind of go, so much the worse for you guys if you're stuck with these things. Um, because if those turn out to be false, then should I really think that all of Christianity is false? So if simplicity turns out to be false, should I really think that Jesus wasn't raised from the dead? Ooh, that seems, that's a weird entailment. I didn't see that one coming. Um, whereas my denomination, we just go, no creed but Christ, um, doesn't really matter if uh, these other, you know, philosophical claims can become, turn out to be false, because we know these other things to be true. So I think these things can really come apart a, a lot more, but not every denomination allows you the freedom to do that. All right. So what about some other religions? How does the the distinction here play out in those? I think that in um, Hinduism, there are various models of God that are uh, recognized in different Hindu systems. Uh, and some of them are more personalist and some of them are less so. Uh, you have a really strong um, sort of apophatic tendency in certain forms of Vedanta and other kinds of Hinduism. Um, you have, of course, that episode in, um, I think it's in the Upanishads, uh, not this, not that, right? Neti neti is this, mm -hmm. uh, is this philosophical practice that Hindus uh, do in order to attain to an intuition, a perception of their true nature. Um, and what they do is they point to something and they say, I'm not that, I'm not this, I'm not this, I'm not this. Um, you know, the, the, the purpose of this exercise is precisely to um, attain to a perception of your true nature, which is no particular thing, no particular object. Uh, the true nature of the self or Atman is Brahman, which is the ultimate reality. And I think Brahman is typically uh, defined in roughly the same terms, uh, terms as God in classical theism. He is uh, immutable, impassable, uh, immortal, um, atemporal, uh, simple, pure consciousness, etc., uh, of course, within Hinduism, there's a distinction between Nirguna Brahma and Sagana Brahma. I, Brahman, I think those are the terms. Nirguna mm -hmm. Brahman is uh, Brahman without qualities. So he's just pure consciousness. He does not have properties. He does have not have any kind of like qualities that we can grasp and understand with our mind. Uh, Saguna Brahman is Brahman with qualities. So you might talk about him in you know making use of various terms. So there are there are certainly sort of like stricter, more philosophical, more apophatic. Um, elements within Hinduism, um, within certain forms of Hinduism. Other forms of Hinduism more closely resemble the kind of uh, what you might call a kind of a neo or, you know, uh, uh, neoclassical theism. I'm thinking, for example, about the bhakti traditions in Hinduism where uh, moksha or salvation is attained through devotion to a god who is understood in personal terms as loving the devotee. Uh, so, for example, you think of Hare Krishna as you think of... Um, Vaishnavism and other forms of Hinduism where you express your you you seek salvation you seek liberation from the cycle of death and rebirth precisely through acts of devotion to a god who is understood personally um, so this is something closer to the kind of neoclassical theism uh, or you know refined you know adjusted classical theism that Ryan is proposing because the god is understood as personal as loving the devotee uh, and as working through grace to save the devotee um, um, so there the approach to God takes place on more explicitly, um, personal terms as opposed to like non-dual Vedanta where the word God or Brahman as the ultimate reality is not understood personally at all. Um, and again, within Hinduism, there are debates, right? So some people think that like the, the, the personal conception of God is not yet the ultimate conception of God. It's a kind of a, it's a, you know, a stop along the way. Once you attain to true enlightenment, you understand not only that God is not personal, but that you're not even distinct from God, that your true inner self is exactly God or Brahman. Uh, so, you know, these, these matters play out a bit differently in Hinduism than they do in Christianity. Uh, but I think that within this religion, you find some of the same distinctions and the same differences in conceptions about God. Ryan, anything? 
Yeah, so I think it's interesting that Stephen's bringing up this Advaita Vedanta school of thought. So, like, so Shankara is a is a philosopher in this tradition, and and he does seem to have the exact like uh, understanding of like classical theism in terms of these attributes. But Shankara's also got something that you'd call like like monism or pantheism or something because everything is identical to God. Uh, so it's not going to be straightforward classical theism because in the, the like the Christian classical theism, they want to say there is a very clear distinction between God and the entire created order. Whereas when you see someone in the Hindu tradition like Shankara, there's no distinction. Uh, any distinctions are just purely illusory. So, you know, whew. Um, but in the Western tradition, it is also the case that there are a lot of arguments from classical uh, attributes to pantheism. So you see this in Spinoza. I mean, Spinoza gives a bunch of different arguments from like the necessity of God, from the infinity of God, from omniscience, from, you know, you name it. And he's trying to get you to this claim that like God and the universe are somehow identical. So I think there is this kind of tendency you see within like different Jewish thinkers and different Hindu thinkers that they start, this looks like it's classical, but it really is pushing you towards something like pantheism. But there are other thinkers in these traditions that uh, look more like panentheism. So uh, there's a thinker in the Islamic tradition named uh, Ibn Taymiyyah, and Ibn Taymiyyah thinks that God has to create a universe of some sort, and he thinks that God's temporal. Um, so it's it's a it's a form of panentheism that you don't quite see in the Christian tradition until maybe like the 20th century, I would think. Uh, some contemporary thinkers in Christianity who look a bit like this this model of God are like Benedict Gurka and Thomas J. Ord. So they've got some affinity there with uh, this this uh, Islamic thinker. And then uh, Ramanuja um, in the Hindu tradition, he's supposedly a panentheist. Uh, depends on who you ask because eh, everybody wants to affirm everybody who's a panentheist. They want to affirm everybody on their side. And then if you're not a panentheist, then you don't want you know you don't want to say no. Those thinkers are actually on my side. Because panentheism is just too fuzzy. But supposedly these thinkers are all in the, the panentheistic camp. Um, there's another uh, Hindu thinker, though, that, that I find really interesting. So his, his name is uh, Raghunatha Shiramani. And he thinks that uh, time and space are attributes of God. So God's not timeless strictly or spaceless strictly because these are attributes of God. And this looks something closer to what you see around the exact same time period in the Christian traditions with Isaac Newton and Samuel Clark. Uh, so... These are people in a lot of these different religious traditions who are trying to like philosophically reflect on the book of nature, or, like the natural world, and are coming to all sorts of different conclusions, and in some cases, very similar conclusions to people in other religious traditions. Uh, so yeah, the, the, these models of God, you see them playing out like all across the world religions, except for maybe open theism. I'm not aware of anyone outside of the Christian tradition who uh, it's in another, another world religion that is an open theist. I've been told there are some, but I haven't been able to look into it enough on my own. Um, but I do know some people who are open theists who are not committed to like any particular religion whatsoever. Um, so that's the only one that I, I am able to like clearly identify in a different like uh, religious tradition. So I saw in the live chat that people are saying their brains are full at this point. So mm -hmm. what I'm thinking, what I'm thinking we might do is switch to, I want to hear y'all stories of how you came to adopt the position that you hold now. Is it something that transition where you once say for for Stephen were you once a class a non classical theist in some sense and then you were convinced by some argument and now you're a classical theist is that the case for you what about you Ryan have you always been a non classical theist what are what are your stories how did you get into the position that you're that you're in today let's start with you Stephen I first began to study theology seriously when I was about sixteen years old. Um, my best friend, his older brother, was holding a Bible study, and uh, my friend and I and a bunch of other friends, we all got together and we learned the Bible, and it was the first time, I think, that I really was taught in a systematic fashion what the Bible teaches about various topics, and that whetted my appetite. I began to be interested in studying theology more seriously after that. So I began to read various, you know, popular-level works, uh, and then sometime after that I began to study philosophy. And when I really first started studying philosophy, I was into basically everybody, you know, who, you know, Christian neophytes in philosophy are into, for example, Alvin Plantinga, Nicholas Fulterstorff, William Lane Craig, these guys. Uh, so my, my entry into philosophy came through a kind of a, um, you know, through the door of apologetics. Um, when I was a, um, in my undergrad, I studied at Arizona State University. And when I began there, I was 
more or less sympathetic to the kind of uh, refined, you know, or redefined classical view that um, Ryan is proposing here. And then I read a book by a friend of mine, Bill Valicella, who owns the Maverick Philosopher blog. Um, I read his book, A Paradigm Theory of Existence, in which he proposes an analysis of existence, of what it is to exist, which ultimately entailed the doctrine of divine simplicity. Um, and once I had read that book, you know, it was like a light turned on in my head and things were clarified for me. And then I got a better understanding, or so I say a better understanding and not a corrupted understanding of what God is and uh, how he relates, you know, to finite beings. From there, after reading Valicella, I read uh, Fazer and other art, you know, authors in the same tradition. Uh, and I just became more and more convinced. I I found in the classical theistic arguments, and especially in the arguments of Thomas Aquinas and others, very convincing proofs of the existence of God, proofs that I think are genuine proofs. I think they, they show that God exists. Um, and so, although in my whole life I've never really had a time where I doubted God's existence, from about that period onward I became philosophically uh, convinced of the existence of God and not just, um, you know, sort of like religiously or personally or existentially convinced. Uh, so I became a classical theist around that point in my in, in my life, about it, when I was a sophomore in in my undergrad, uh, after being a, a non classical theistic personalist or whatever you might call it. Going back to that lecture that I was listening from from Ed Fazer earlier today, he mentioned uh, what he started out with when he was giving the the two rival views of God. He started out by by listing the arguments and saying that this is sort of the conception that follows from the arguments that he was convinced by too. So it's it's interesting to hear. A kind of similar story in your case it was like some of the arguments and as you got into apologetics and then you read the book that kind of convinced you of the doctrine of simplicity so that's cool uh well ryan what about you what what is your story in, the, in this yes yeah. so i went to a, a christian school for like for high school and all my bible teachers at the time were calvinists so i was just kind of drinking the well of calvinism uh, because they made it look really cool and my parents really hated Calvinism. So to be like rebellious, like I was just like, you know, well, I have to go like big or go home. So just like, yeah, free will. What is that? It doesn't matter. Uh, you know, we're fully like fully determined by God. I didn't know what that meant because I was 16, but you know, whatever. Uh, and so then when I went to university, I started reading a lot of major thinkers like uh, St. Augustine. I was just like working through the city of God. Uh, and I really fell in love with classical theism at that point. So I was really, really committed to trying to understand all these different classical attributes uh, from thinkers like uh, like Augustine and like Aquinas. And then during my master's, um, uh, I was working on philosophy of religion and systematic theology and trying to write a dissertation on what is God's relationship to time. And so I thought I could make a way for God to be timeless. And I couldn't quite figure it out. So I was like, OK, I'll just do a Ph.D. on this. And then during my Ph.D., the title of the dissertation was In Search of a Timeless God. And during that uh, that time period, like I was really again trying to think like there might be a way to make this work. And by the time I was done with it, I, I couldn't I couldn't make it work. I could I was able to find too many problems with what it meant to say that God was timeless, immutable, simple, and so on. Too many conflicts within the God world relationship. Too many conflicts in my mind with uh, basic Christian doctrine. And then you know, and of course, then the fact that I just couldn't see it in Scripture. So I was like, this is I just can't I can't have this anymore. And, and so then when I wrote the book version of it. Uh, originally, it was going to be called In Search of the Timeless God, and then Oxford University Press said, you can't have that title because you didn't find one. You didn't find a timeless God, so you got to have a new title. And so I was like, okay, fine. So I talked to Oliver Crisp, and I was like, can I have the death of the timeless God? Because it's like, that's really metal. It's really cool. I like it. And then there, the Oxford was like, no, no, you can't have that because that sounds like the death of God movement. And I was like, nobody, who even knows about that movement anymore? <laughs> and then... The next day, I met a woman who that she just teaches a class on that, and I was like, "Oh, fine, okay." Some people still do this, apparently. So, so yeah. So originally, yeah, uh, really committed to classical theism, trying to think how can I make this work, and then eventually, at some point, just going, "I do not know how to make this work. I've tried really hard, but I, I just can't." So, okay, uh, so I had to, to give finish, it up. You have to finish your story. Like, what did you end up writing, uh, naming the book? So the book is now called "The End of the Timeless God." The end, which okay. is so it's, <laughs> it's fine you know um it's just not as catchy uh it's the not next, as metal it's not as metal um and then the next the next book that's going to come out later this year is just called god and emotion that's not very metal it's super it's super emo um but the the book after that's gonna be called from divine time maker to divine watchmaker and that I don't know, it's really not that metal i guess but it sounds more like sounds more indie rock but like it's it's 
somewhere getting closer to what I actually want for a title, but I don't know, book publishers these days. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, that's interesting. Let's get to some Q and A. Are you guys up for that? Sure. All right, let's do it. So here's the first one from Paul Rimmer. He says, uh, and this is super chat. So thank you for that. He says, what makes God, God, what would essentially distinguish God from a very powerful alien intelligence? Why worship God and not another super being? This might be directed at you, Ryan. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I know Paul. Uh, we overlapped at okay. St. Andrews. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so in my mind, what it means to be God, and this is the thing I think all the models of God have mentioned, they have this in common. So they all want to say that God is the greatest metaphysically possible being. He's absolutely perfect. Um, but what does that mean? So it means at least a few different things. Uh, first, it means that God has to have what's called extensive superiority, which means that whatever the great making properties are, whatever the things that make a being uh, better uh, than anything else, God has all of those. So if if like maximal power, if that's like uh, like you know better to have than not have, if that's a great making property, God's got it. And so you can count up all these different great making properties or perfections. And if uh, whatever the greatest being is, it's got those. Um, then the other part of the claim is God has intensive superiority. So for any in, in particular uh, attribute that you point out, like power or knowledge, God has it to a, a superior degree such that nothing else is superior to, to this being. So he's got more knowledge than anything else. He's got more power than anything else. So... Whatever great making attributes are, God's got all of them, extensive superiority. And whatever he has, he's got them to this uh, completely uh, superior intensity or like to maximal degree. And then he's the source of all these things. So those are kind of like wrapped up in these claims about God. Um, I'll give one other definition that I think all these models of God can agree on, that there's a sense in which you want to say, whatever God is, he is the single or sole uh, ultimate ground of all of reality. So if you want to say like there's a bunch of contingent stuff, then God's got to be the explanation for all of that. If a bunch of stuff is necessarily exists, um, then you want to say, well, God still has to be the explanation for all of that. So the, whatever that, that rock bottom thing in reality is. And I think these, again, I want to say all the models of God we discussed today, they all want to affirm this. Is there anything you'd like to say, Stephen, on that question? Yeah. Uh, what makes God, God is, um, an excellent question. I would say that he is not a very powerful alien intelligence and not a super being because he is not a being at all. Um, what God is, is pure undifferentiated reality, uh, and the ground and the cause of everything that exists. Uh, there could only in principle be one such thing. Um, now the question is why worship him? Uh, this is a really fascinating question and this is something that I've been speculating on lately. Uh, I'm thinking about the question of worship of God in light of the fact that God, according to classical theism, does not enter into any real relations with his creatures. So God, for example, is not affected. He does not hear. He is not like listening to my song of worship. When I sing before the throne of God above, for example, it's not like God is like moved and receives that worship in some way. So then the question is, okay, what does it mean to actually worship God? Um, here I would like to propose a speculative interpretation of Irenaeus' uh, line that the glory of God is the human being fully alive. Um, I think that, you know, what it is to worship God, or this is the idea that I'm entertaining, I'm speculating here, I'm not committed to this. Uh, what does it mean to worship God? It means to be a human being, right? To live your life and to be a human being as created by God and to uh, actualize your potentiality and to, you know, to hold on to life and to, to love it. So, to be thankful to God for the things that he gives you is just to be thankful for them. Um, and to love God is just to love your being and to love uh, the fact of being and to accept it and to live in the world in a, in a kind of a gratitude for being. Um, these are speculative proposals and I can't enter into a lot of detail here. You know, I, I don't know that I could develop a thought very much, but this is a, this is a way that I'm thinking of the nature of worship given classical theism. What we can say is that God like hears our songs and accepts them somehow, right? Because he's impassable, he's immutable, he, you know, that, that is thrown out the window. Uh, so there has to be some other way of understanding what worship means according to classical theism. And the, the thought that I'm speculating here is that worship is just being what you are and doing it well. And that is a worship of God because, again, it's a, it's a making use of the gift of being that you receive from God. So here's probably the most important question we will answer today. It's for both of you guys. What subgenre of metal would the following thinkers listen to and why? Augustine, Aquinas, Leibniz, Herschel, and Heidegger. 
I will say, I think Husserl would like math metal because he was a mathematician before he was a philosopher. I think Heidegger would probably like, um, I don't know, death metal because he's a being towards death as a Dasein. Uh, I think Augustine would probably like that sort of like really melodic kind of metal music, you know, that has progressions and it, mm -hmm. it, it's like a nice melody line and like the epic singing. Uh, and Aquinas, this is what I think. I think Aquinas would listen to Gregorian chant, but with like a really subtle metal guitar background, right? So that it sounds very <laughs> ominous. That's what I think. Yeah, well, this you is forgot Leibniz. Well, uh, like, yeah, well, Leibniz, it's going to be German deathcore. Um, so there's a band called We Butter the Bread with Butter, and that's most likely who Leibniz is going to be listening to. Um, with Aquinas, though, like, so there's a band called Liturgy, and so they do like some weird Gregorian chant, and then it's like this bizarre kind of like uh, like prog, but like a little bit of like math metal. Like I, I, I'm almost tempted to say Aquinas would do that, but I might think he's, he would find it too chaotic. So he'd be like, "Give me some more doom metal here, something that's like really really long, like all of my books, you know, uh, and, and you know, like and they, like they kind of like sort of go somewhere eventually, but you know, it just takes forever to get there. That's what I'm thinking with uh, with Aquinas, yeah." You guys are metal nerds. I'm not at all. I don't mm -hmm. know anything about metal. Nothing. Nothing. All right. Another super chat from Gina M. Thank you for that. She says, Stephen, if we agree that God is the cause of all things, including, for example, our logic, can't we then say positive things about him based on his creation? For example, that he must know logic. Well, I think we'd have to get clear on what logic is and what it is about. Um, I've been reading a little bit about this in my readings from Husserl, so I, I can give an extremely uninformed and vague and undeveloped answer to this question. Um, I think that logic um, is a way in, I think that logic has to do not just with like rules of thought or whatever, I think that ultimately it's grounded in being. I think that, for example, the reason why the law of non-contradiction is a law of logic is because, supposing that it is a law of logic, uh, is because that's the way that being is. You know, when we make judgments, when we form arguments, when we, you know, utter propositions, we're talking about the world. We're talking about being. Um, and the, the adequacy of our judgments and our propositions and formulations of ideas about being has to be grounded in being itself and its intrinsic structures. Um, so I would say that the laws of logic, you know, are formulations of the essential structures of being. Um, now, okay, God is not a being, right? So uh, that means, for example, that his relationship to logic is going to be very different. In one sense, he is the cause of logic in the sense it, because he is the cause of being. God is the cause of being, and that means that he's also the cause of the intrinsic structures of being on which our logic is grounded. Um, but does God know that? I mean, that's, this is like a separate question regarding God's knowledge. I don't know what God's knowledge is. I know that he causes the world to exist. I know that he causes it to exist as intelligible to us. Uh, and as capably and, and as capable of being known by us, and so in that sense, he also makes us capable of knowing the world. Um, but I would I don't know how it is that God knows things. That's a, something about the intrinsic way of that God exists. That's something about his intrinsic nature that I don't have access to. I don't know. Ryan, looks like you want to say something. Yeah. So so Stephen, you want to say God's omniscient. You just you just want to say you don't know how he knows things, but you want to say he does that he knows things, though, right? Yeah, I, I mean, I wonder how to define omniscience. On the one hand, we could say that God is omniscient in the sense that he is the cause of everything that exists, and there's nothing that exists that, like, escapes his attention, so to speak. Um, we could also say that he is the ground of every possible being. So if you admit that there are possible beings in addition to actual beings, then he is the ground of all possibility. Um, but I think that like there really is no other way to talk about God with any kind of and get any kind of grasp on it except through this filter of causality. We have to think of God as the cause of things, you know, in the absence of special revelation. That's what we have to work with. Um, and so in that case, even God's knowledge would have to be understood causally. You know, so does God know that I'm talking to you right now? Yes. Why is that? Well, because he is causing this situation to take place. Mm -hmm. um, so even then, God's knowledge could be understood causally. But I don't. I really don't know what it is for God to know. I have no idea. You know, does God know the proposition that two plus two equals four? Um, what could that mean except that God Himself is the ground of the reality of two and four and addition and the rest of that? 
right? So I, my temptation is to interpret God's knowledge causally in terms mm -hmm. of what he, what he grounds to be. Uh, but admittedly, that's a far different conception of knowledge than what we have, right? Our knowledge, our knowledge, if it's going to be knowledge, can't be causal. I can't cause things <laughs> uh, in order to know them. I have to be receptive to them. So our knowledge is of a different nature. God is not receptive, you know, in his knowledge at all. That okay, seems so this to imply is, fatalism. Sorry. I was well, yeah, that was, so that's the question I was going to ask. So, um, so this is a view called universal divine causality, which is very, very common in the classical tradition. It's very popular in classical tradition. Um, so <laughs> the claim is that God is the cause of absolutely everything, including your desires, your thoughts, your actions, anything that exists. God is the direct, immediate cause of those things. Um, and I know that, like, you know, Stephen doesn't want to affirm uh, fatalism, um, but that is a worry. But we, maybe that's just something to get into, like, in the, in the next episode. But... Sure. But that's that's it is, so it is a but it, is that when you're wanting to affirm though is something like universal divine causality? I, I use the term cause. Um, I it's tricky because sure. again, God is not a cause like I am a cause, right? right? I when I you know hit my fist on the table that causes something, um, or you know when I move my mouth and I you know my vocal cords vibrate as I'm talking, I'm causing things to happen. But God doesn't cause in that way. What God causes is not. Uh, a modification in something, but the very being of the thing. Um, you know, God God causes me to exist. Other things cause me to take on various modifications in certain ways. For example, um, you know, my stomach or my body's lack of nutrients causes me to feel hungry. Uh, but what God causes is for me to exist in the first place with this entire system of causes in place. And I think something similar to causation, it's not quite causation, but it's something similar to causation takes place also with respect to other things. But again, I think ultimately these things have to have their grounding in being. The number two is caused by God, but in what sense? I, you know, I, I tend to think that like the number two is just um, uh, an, ex an expansion on the concept of the number one, and one itself is gained through the contact that we have with individual beings. So we've, we form this notion of oneness because we encounter individual beings and experience, and then once we have one, you know, we do various modifications to that notion and gain a whole system of mathematics. But I'm sure that this is speculative, and I, I don't know enough about the topic to speak confidently. All right, let's move on to another question. This one's from Tanner Terry. Uh, thank you for the super chat. And uh, so here, here it is. How do, you all, how do all three of you feel about the essence-energy distinction? And this is a quote. The operations are various and the essence simple, but we say that we know our God from his operations, but do not undertake to approach near to his essence. From St. Basil, letter 234. So I don't have any thoughts on that, but what about you guys? Uh, Stephen, because you're, you're flirting with Eastern Orthodoxy more than I am, so I'm assuming you've got more positive things to say about it. Yeah, I, I really do not understand the essence energies distinction. I remember reading an article posted on the Eclectic Orthodoxy blog, um, which sounded to me like it was an interpretation of ess ess essence and energy along the lines of, um, you know, something like Thomism. The energy is the effect that God produces. The essence is God in himself. I really don't understand the distinction. Supposedly, God is supposed to have, you know, uncreated energies, um, uncreated activities, which, uh, through which we can know God. Um, I don't know what it would mean to say that they're uncreated energies um, if you grant that uh, the creation itself and all finite being is contingent, right? So if there's an uncreated energy that, and the creation is contingent, then the energy cannot be a creation. It, it's not a finite being. It's not an effect of God. It's something that is somehow connected to his uh, essence. But I really don't know what it is. I can agree, for example, that we know about God not in essence but through his effects that he produces, but I do not... I think the energy is supposed to be like some me mediating term between the essence and the, eff the, the created effect or the, the finite effect. And I just don't know what that could be. I don't understand it. Yeah. So David Bradshaw is um, a contemporary Eastern Orthodox philosopher who's tried to detail this distinction in, in, uh, in some really concise ways. But I do, I, I agree with Stephen. Like I really struggle to understand what the distinction is supposed to be. So Matthew Levering um, has considered some objections from Bradshaw and some others because uh, it's supposed to be this that this essence energy distinction can be used as a, objections to like uh, to mystic understandings of God and simplicity in particular. Uh, and Matthew Levering just goes, I don't know, like when you look at some different claims here about essence and energy, it looks just like what Aquinas would say. 
Uh, and some other times it looks like the exact opposite of what the Eastern Orthodox want to say. And then I asked some different Eastern Orthodox thinkers and they're like, we disagree on everything. And that's part of our charm, uh, which I which I like. But it still leaves me none the wiser as what this distinction really amounts to. Um, I would say that on my model of God, I don't need it because I don't think God's actions are identical to God's existence. And I think God does have potential to do one thing or another. So I, I don't even need this distinction whatsoever. So I would, so on my model of God and a bunch of other models of God, it would just be unmotivated entirely. Uh, whereas on classical theism, maybe you could try to motivate it, but I, you know, I'm, I'm with Stephen. I just, I don't, I don't know what it really amounts to. Okay. Fair enough. And this one is from uh, Travis Quinn. Thank you for your super chat. He says, Paul Tillich speaks pejoratively of theological theism. Are either of you familiar with Tillich and how that phrase would fit into this discussion? No, not me. <sighs> I'm trying to, I mean, I'm familiar with Tillich, but uh, not enough. Um, Tillich is somebody who I often, again, struggle to understand. So um, G. E. Moore has this great moment where he's uh, he's looking at Paul Tillich and he says, he's like, he's like, you know, Professor Tillich, would you disagree with an atheist on this or this or this? And, and, and Paul's like, no, of course not. Of course not. And then G. E. Moore goes, I have not understood one word that this man has said, not one single word. And I want to go, yeah, that's right. I just, I do not understand what Tillich's getting at most of the time. So I, theological theism, mm, I don't know, man. Sorry. You just don't understand Aquinas. I just don't understand Aquinas, but you know, there's lots Nobody of things does. I don't understand. Nobody does, though. It's okay. It's okay. All right. From John Nathan, Super Chat. Thank you for this. He says, if you guys can, can you interview Father Deacon Ananias? Ananias? He has a, a YouTube channel called Norwegian News. He is from the Eastern Orthodox Church. I, I, don't, I don't know have, if you're... I have met uh, Deacon Ananias. So I presented at the inaugural conference of the International Orthodox Theological Association in 2019 uh, in Romania. And I met him. We were both on a panel on the topic, I think, of natural theology. I read a paper on the intelligibility of the cosmos uh, for Dimitris Daniloye, who's a Romanian Orthodox theologian. And he read another paper on a different topic. I think his paper had more to do with the question of modernity and various uh, philosophical problems that were inherited by modernity as a result of a deviation from orthodox theology. Um, so I've, I've met him before. He's a very nice guy. I haven't spoken with him in detail about these issues, uh, however, uh, but I think he might make an interesting dialogue partner. Hmm. There you go, Ryan. Invite him on. on there we the go. Podcast. All right. Well, here we go. Here's a, a question from Johnny Waldrop. Thank you for your super chat. He says, Stephen and Ryan, please talk about simplicity and the Trinity. Please talk about whether or not simplicity is compatible with the affirmations in the Athanasian Creed. So obviously, Stephen, I assume that you think they're compatible because you're a Christian. You're a Trinitarian, I assume. Yeah. Okay. Uh, well, yeah. What, what What do you think the problem is? Mm -hmm. And then what is what is your solution to that? And then maybe we'll get Ryan's response. The problem is that you know, as I defined God earlier, according to the doctrine of divine, of divine simplicity, he is pure, undifferentiated reality. Um, and of course, to say that he's undifferentiated is to say that there's nothing within him that's different. He's just a pure reality. Uh, this seems to conflict straight away with the notion that God eternally subsists in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, who are distinct from one another, um, even as they are not three, you know, different beings. Uh, so on the one hand, the doctrine of divine simplicity doesn't allow for internal differentiation. On the other hand, the doctrine of the, of the, of the Trinity seems to require it. I would say this, uh, Louis Ayers and Khaled Anatolios and others make very clear that in the historical development of the doctrine of the Trinity, uh, divine simplicity was paramount. You know, divine simplicity was taken for granted by people on both sides. Uh, some of the opponents of the doctrine of the, Trini of the Trinity made use of the doctrine of divine simplicity to argue against it. Uh, but the proponents of the Trinity, such as um, Augustine, did not give up divine simplicity simply in order to save the doctrine of the Trinity. Uh, and Louis Ayers, especially in his Nicaea and its Legacy, has a chapter on Augustine in which he makes very clear that for Augustine, what preserves monotheism, in spite of the distinction of persons, is precisely the divine simplicity. Uh, so, historically, divine simplicity was important in preserving Trinitarianism as a form of monotheism. I would say this as a, as a result of, as a, an answer to this question. Philosophically, we can know that God exists only as a pure undifferentiated reality. 
Um, we don't have access to anything within God that would make him diverse or differentiated or whatever. So philosophically, what we can say about God is that he is pure undifferentiated reality. reality. With the advent of Christ into the world, we find the revelation of the doctrine of the Trinity, um, and we also find that there are relations which distinguish the persons of the Trinity from one another. Uh, they share the same divine essence. There's one omnipotence, one, you know, uh, divine goodness, one divine knowledge, which is shared equally among the persons. It's not like they all have a goodness of their own. Uh, and yet at the same time, there's a distinction between the persons. Now, I want to make clear here that what actually is the relation of differentiation between those persons, nobody knows. There is no other example of the relation of filiation, for example, or begetting that obtains between the Father and the Son. Nor is there another instance in all of reality of the relation of spiration, which obtains between the Father and the Holy Spirit, or the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Um, so it's true that we identify these relations in virtue of which the persons are different, but we don't know what these relations are, and there are no other examples of this in all of cre the created order. So they're just sort of like, you know, X. It's like God is, the Father is distinguished from the Son in virtue of X, and the, the Spirit is distinguished from the Father and the Son in virtue of Y. But what are those relations? We have no idea. It's just that this is seemingly the interpretation we have to give to the doctrine in light of the revelation of Christ uh, and of the Holy Spirit. Um, I would say that I don't think that there's necessarily a conflict between the Trinity and the doctrine of divine simplicity because, again, the differentiation within God is, in, is supposed to be entirely internally generated. The Father, you know, out of his nature, generates the Son and... Uh, um, and, uh, uh, you know, spirates the spirit or begets the son and spirates the spirit. So this is a, this is a process of differentiation that has its origins within God himself. It's not something that comes from the outside of God. So in that sense, the doctrine of the Trinity is not a compromise, is not, does not compromise God's aseity. And it also does not compromise, I think, God's simplicity. If we understand that this differentiation of persons takes place intrinsically and necessarily. But again, I would emphasize also that we don't know what the relations that differ that differentiate the persons from each other. We don't know what they are. Ryan, looks like you were taking notes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So, okay. So a couple of thoughts. Um, so one, I, I don't think we should really care too much about the Athanasian Creed. It's not one of the ecumenical creeds. We don't even know who wrote it. Uh, not, it's not like a council came together to, to try to work on it. So... Meh. Who who really cares? Uh, well, I mean, that's that's a bit that's a bit uh, uh, candid, but uh, or sorry. Anyway, um, the the if you're wanting to really try to figure out do you have an orthodox understanding of the Trinity, you should look more at what the ecumenical creeds are. Uh, so something like Nicaea, um, whereas the Athanasian Creed, there's no council or ecumenical creed uh, that's attached to it. So, but the question though is exactly like Stephen pointed out. Like it, the claim is God's this pure undifferentiated reality, but the Trinity seems like it's supposed to have these differ differentiation within God. And sure, it is the case that like Augustine and others were like, yeah, no problem. But it's also the case that a bunch of Jews and a bunch of Muslims looked at Christians and were like, you guys are absolutely crazy. If God is simple, you cannot get the persons up, uh, like different persons up and running. Um, so the conflict is very, very real. So just so we can have like the Lewis Ayers sort of argument, which is, well, Augustine didn't see a problem. But then you could just go, well, but everybody else did. So deal with the problem. Um so the Augustine, I think, does see the problem, though, because Augustine tries to introduce this idea of subsistent relations in, in order to distinguish the persons. The problem that like this is a problem that Richard Cross and William Hasker and others have pointed out is if God's really simple, there is nothing to ground whatever these subsistent relations are. And that's even setting aside the question of what on earth could it mean to have a subsistent relation? But um, two further thoughts on this. One is. If you want to say that these persons are distinguished by their relations of processions, um, this is a causal relationship. Um, and the language of Nicaea is explicitly causal. Uh, eternal generation, eternal spiration, it is claiming that the Father is the, the causal source of the Son and the Holy Spirit. Uh, and so sometimes this gets cashed out in terms of the Father is distinct because of his act of filiation, which he is identical to because he's simple. And the son is identical to his act of being begotten because he is, you know, simple and so on and so on. So you've got supposedly three different acts. Well, if you affirm divine simplicity, you say all of God's acts are identical to each other, such that there's one act. 
And so I'm like, well, oh, que pale. Like the, the distinction I was supposed to have was these three different acts. Well, now they're all gone because if I'm going to be consistent with the doctrine of divine simplicity, there's only one act, and that one act is identical to God's essence and existence. So the sort of trying to get these uh, these differentiations in there, uh, some kind of relations in there, it's it's hard to figure out how you could even make that fit. Where would you put it? Uh, the final thought I had was, so this claim from Stephen was that um, the differentiation has its origin in God, so it's all eternal, internal, and not external, so it's no big deal. Well, if that's the case, then I, I think like anybody who denies divine simplicity, they're going to be like, well, all these distinctions are internal to God too, like distinctions between like you know, God's thoughts, uh, God's attributes, those are all internal to God, and they're all you know, like part of uh, the divine essence. So like, I, I guess if that's the case, then I don't understand like, like the phaser sort of objection that like this is the only way to have a uh, like monotheism or something because like if it's not a bad if it's not bad for simplicity to have differentiation that's internal then it shouldn't be bad for all the other models of god that have internal differentiation as well steven is there something you could say quickly in response before we move on or would you like to leave it there for for next time for part two well i can't let ryan have the last word so naturally i have to <laughs> say something um, I would say that it's not of the same sort. Um, hmm. The differentiation between the persons of the Trinity is utterly unique, whereas the differentiation between like my various thoughts and then my capacity as a mind to hold thoughts and then also the difference between my act of thinking and my act of will and so on, it's, it's on an entirely different order of composition um, and reduces, again, God to the category of being, whereas the relations of the Trinity are unique and have no analogy in the created world. All right, we'll leave it there. And uh, like, I, like I mentioned at the beginning of this, we are going to do a part two. And it's going to be uh, fireworks. You know, it's going to be a fight to the death kind of thing. So it's going to be awesome. And we're uh, we're basically just working on timing at this point. But probably it will happen within uh, a few weeks, a couple weeks. We'll see. All right, next question from Converse Contender. Why, what do they think of Molinism and how it relates? Any Any thoughts? No one? Uh, I mean, I've got lots of thoughts on Molinism, but Stephen, like, I'm curious about you. Yeah, what are, what are you, Nemesh? Are you a uh, are you a Molinist, Calvinist? What are you? Yeah, I, I um, I'm not a Molinist. I I really like Molinism in principle, but I think that the grounding objection to Molinism is is devastating. Um, I really. I, I go back and forth on this question of the nature of divine providence. On the one hand, it seems to me that classical theism meshes really well with the sort of Augustinianism, which is basically a version of theological determinism. Um, and friends of mine, like Paul Monata, for example, would probably say that if you're going to be a classical theist, you might as well just be a, a Calvinist or an Augustinian or whatever, because that's really the only way. I am also, again, speculating about the possibility of a different conception of divine providence, according to which history takes place sort of in, in two stages. Uh, there's what God causes, and then there's human beings' free reactions to these causes, which are not caused by God. However, our possibility of acting is itself sustained by God, who keeps us in existence. Uh, so it's, it's never the case that God reacts to things that we do. Uh, however, what God causes is one part of the story. It's a kind of a call. Uh, and then our free actions, our responses to those things, which then elicit further further calls and further reactions. Um, you know, and so there's this sort of interaction. But I this is all speculative and I would have to work it out. I don't have a I don't have a definite view yet. What, what about uh, you, Ryan? Do you think that the, that it yeah, what's the relation? Um so Molinism is affirmed by some classical theists, because like Molina and Suarez and others, like they they were classical theists. Uh, and then Tom Flint is a contemporary classical theist who's a Molinist. Um, but then, like, you've got a bunch of people like like William Lane Craig who are not classical theists, and they're like, Molinism seems pretty awesome. So I think it's a view that um, lots of different models of God can affirm, other than open theism, because open theism says God has no exhaustive foreknowledge. So they think that uh, the grounding objection is decisive and Molinism is just off the table. Uh, and then they think... Um, Freedom is not compatible with determinism, so they're going to say theological determinism off the table. So if you want something like libertarian freedom and God having exhaustive foreknowledge, it seems like Molinism is the only game in town, but that grounding objection is really, really bad. And I don't, gosh, yeah, I don't know any uh, good answers to it at, at this point in time. There is another view, though, that Ryan Byerly has been developing. He calls the time ordering account. And there's some really crazy stuff you can do in philosophy of time um, where you can get something that looks kind of like Molinism, but it relies on some different claims within philosophy of time called ersatz uh, B-theory, 
where you can have sort of views that are supposed to be able to escape grounding objections. Uh, and, and so you could have this sort of account, supposedly, that would be free from any grounding objections, and it would look pretty similar to Molinism. But that's way more detailed than I'm, ex- I'm, I'm uh, prepared to go into at the moment with 10 minutes left to go. Yeah. Well, uh, you might be interested to learn that while you were talking, we got a downvote on the video. So mm. I don't know what you said that angered somebody, but it, <laughs> it happened. It was my fault. So. <laughs> All right, let's move on to, uh, we have a few more questions to answer and we'll try to close it out pretty quickly here. From 20 Faces, he says, and thank you for your super chat. He says, why would a perfect being create anything? Does acting not imply some sort of scarcity? Actions are goal oriented after all, and God should have no needs or wants. E- either person, let's start with. Well, so Stephen, it looks like you were about to say something. Yeah. Um, so I agree that action impl- generally action implies needs or wants, um, and God lacks nothing. Uh, but I think precisely because God lacks nothing, therefore his act of creation can be understood as a generosity and as a grace. Um, Ryan and I have talked about the topic of divine simplicity and the question of modal collapse and the freedom of God to create or not to create uh, on various um, occasions. I think ultimately classical theism sees the world as contingent. It exists. God created it. He did not have to create it. There was no internal necessity for God to create it. Um, You know, there was nothing about this world that necessitated that God create it. So it's seen as a gift. It's just a it's a it's a pure gift, um, and that's what makes our existence, I think, so special and so fantastic. I you know because of this pure gift, which God does give to me, without Him needing to do so, or without Him having like an overarching reason for doing so, it's just pure generosity. For that reason, my life is so special, and that's for that reason I I am am so happy to be alive and to enjoy the world and to enjoy the good things that God has created for us. Uh, so I think uh, God creates without having to, without having any reason to, without benefiting at all, um, simply as a gift and for our benefit, you know, and for our good. I love that. Uh, I don't. Anything to add, Ryan? (laughs) Oh, you don't like it? Yeah, I don't like it at all. No. um, So so I've got a brand new paper out in, that's going to be out in the Journal of Open Theology uh, called uh, The Problem of Arbitrary Creation. And so what I do is I look at the classical tradition. The classical tradition says that God does uh, everything for a reason. Like God's perfectly rational. If he, God does nothing arbitrarily, and so he never acts without a reason. And they look at all the possible reasons that you could have for God creating a universe. And on every single one of them, there's some sort of response to something outside of himself, something external. Uh, and so you can't have any of that because if God's impassable, he can't be responsive or moved by or influenced by anything external. So I think when you get to this claim that there is no reason for God to create, uh, that's really bad because then it compromises, well, it actually directly contradicts the claim that God is perfectly rational, which is that God always acts for a reason. So you either have to maintain the rest of the classical claims or you have to get rid of perfect rationality because then you've got God acting arbitrarily. Uh, and then within the Christian tradition, I, like no one really wants to say that. Um, within the Islamic tradition, there are some classical theists who want to say God can act arbitrarily, but then you've got a bunch of other classical theists saying that, again, compromises the very idea that God is sovereign and perfectly rational. So I think this is a very serious problem. Um, and if people are wanting to look more into it, it's uh, Norman Kretzmann has a paper called The General Problem of Creation, uh, which is just the question is, why would God create anything at all? Um, so yeah, I, I think... Other models of God do not have this problem because they can res- they can say God creates for different reasons, like certain values he couldn't get without uh, a created order. So certain values like the relationship between creator and creature. God can't have that uh, value in the world without creatures. Um, does God need that value? No, but um, it's a good value. And if God you know, has desires for good things, then that would be a reason to motivate God to create a universe. But that's, you know, it's a longer topic, though. Hmm. I, I think the two of your views that you just laid out are compatible. It sounds like he wasn't saying, may, maybe I'm just misunderstanding, but it didn't sound hmm. like he was saying that God acts arbitrarily. He's, he's saying that there's a value in genero- being generous and there's a value in grace. And so that could be a reason why God creates. Is that compatible with what you're saying, Stephen? Um, so I, 
I don't like this notion of perfect rationality because, again, then we're thinking of God as like something like a rational agent who has all these reasons before him and then does calculations and then figure out what the right thing to do. Uh, I don't think about God in those terms at all. He is not, an, he's not a, a rational agent making choices. The doctrine of divine simplicity, I think, excludes that. Um, so, again, we have to think about God's creating in terms of his being the cause of things. Um, classical theism says God doesn't benefit anything from his creating us. He lives in perfect and undisturbed bliss, right? He doesn't benefit at all. He doesn't lose anything if we go out of existence. He doesn't gain anything if we're in existence. So then our existence is a gift to us. It's for us. Um, it's a gift to, for us from God, a pure gift, which we receive in thanksgiving and which we enjoy um, on the basis of his goodness. But it's not because he has anything to gain from it or anything to lose from not having it. All right, let's do a couple more questions and we'll close it out. From David LaRosa. Thank you for your super chat. He says, any thoughts on semantics, the study of sound, vibration, and their interaction with so-called matter, including our DNA through theoretical frequencies of love and fear? Any association with John 1, 1 through 4? I, Do you have any I thoughts have on that at all? Yep. No, I've got nothing. Sorry. <laughs> I mean, I, I think I am too um, scientifically ignorant to know. I mean, I thought that sound and vibration and so on are properties of matter, right? You can't have sound where there's no, like a, where there's a void, right? So you have to have matter. I, it's, I mean, really, it's like the, you know, particles or whatever that are coming out of my mouth that vibrate at a certain tendency or whatever. I, I don't, I'm assuming that's something like how, you know, sound is produced. So you can't have sound without matter. Uh, I don't think that, like the word of God is itself like a sound that is spoken into the universe and somehow reverberates in matter. I don't think that that's a totally, um, I don't think that that's an adequate way of, of understanding what John is saying. I could be mistaken, but again, I have no idea about any of this stuff. All right. Last question from Tanner Terry this is another question. Uh, he, he sent in one earlier, but this one is, is God's act of creation identical to God's act of foreknowledge? And is that identical to God's loving kindness and so on? I would say that we have to understand exactly what is meant by those terms. Um, there are two ways of understanding phrases like God's act of creation. Uh, on the one hand, it could be understood to refer to that in virtue of which God creates. And on the other hand, it can be understood as referring to the effect of that action insofar as it's produced by God. Um, God's act of creation in this first sense, right? God creates in virtue of himself. If he foreknows things, he foreknows things in virtue of himself. If he is loving kind, then he is loving kind in virtue of himself. So in that respect, uh, they're all the same thing. But God's foreknowledge in terms of like, in terms of the effect produced, it's not all the same thing, right? So God's foreknowledge, if you can come up with some understanding of what that means in terms of the effect that it produces, uh, perhaps, for example, uh, that, you know, maybe God's foreknowledge has to do with the fact that history has a direction and that uh, what happens at certain points in time takes place in light of things that will happen later on in time. Um, so maybe if you can understand if you can understand God's foreknowledge in that sense as an as a as a, uh, a quality of the created world, uh, then no, it's not the same thing as His loving kindness. God's loving kindness would be the fact that He, you know, saves a person or that He re redeems a person from sin or whatever. Uh, God's foreknowledge would have to do with the ordering of the events of history, you know, relative to one another in. Uh, God's act of creation, understood in this sense, is just the coming into existence of a, of a created being or of a finite being. Uh, so understood in terms of effects, they're distinct, but understood in terms of what what is in God that explains these effects, it's the same thing. Anything, anything, Ryan? Uh, so this is something we're going to be discussing a lot more at length in the, in the next uh, episode. So all I'll say at the moment is on my model of God, the answer is no, these things are not identical because God has distinct acts. All right. Well, we are at the end of this part one. And again, this is part one of a two part show that we're doing with Ryan and Stephen on classical theism, non classical versions of God or, or understandings of the nature of God. And so this one is part one where we're just kind of getting some groundwork we're looking at some of the, di the the differences between the two views. And so in part two, we're actually going to have a, a dialogue and it's sort of, it's not going to be a formal debate or anything like that. Normally what I host on my channel are informal discussions where two people with opposing views can come on and just have a moderated discussion. And it's going to be really cool. Like I said, it's going to be basically a fight to the death. Not, not really. These guys, I mean, you can see that they're, 
they're really cool and uh, they can disagree cordially and that's that's the kind of interactions that I promote on my channel. Is there anything that you guys... I think our next discussion will be like, uh, I remember reading about one case in which the winner, the declared winner of an Olympic wrestling match actually died. Uh, (laughs) What was happening is he was being choked uh, and then he did some move where he broke the other guy's leg uh, just as he was dying and the other guy tapped out, but he died. So, uh, you know, the guy who won the match uh, by tap out uh, died uh, at the end of the match. So maybe that's what it'll be like next time. One of us will die and the other one will tap out. (laughs) Wow. Well, is is there anything that you'd like to leave with the audience? Uh, any any kind of summarizing thoughts that you have? Maybe maybe something that we didn't touch on that we need to just quickly go over. Or if you're if you feel good about it, then we can just uh, close it out and then look forward to to part two. I guess I'll just say one thing, which is, it seems to me that when 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 Christians are looking at these issues, I think it's important to see that there are multiple models of God on offer. And it's important to really try to understand what each model is saying um, biblically, philosophically, theologically, uh, in order to judge them accurately. And so what we're, Stephen and I are trying to do today is show you just at least two of these models, uh, how they, what they look like and how they deal with objections to try to see them from the inside out. And so that's what I hope uh, your listeners are able to come away with is a better understanding of these issues. Excellent. And if you want to get, if you want to get more information about Ryan or, or about Stephen, then check the link in the description. Stephen, is there anything you'd like to leave? With the audience? Yeah, I would say uh, a lot of people hearing me talk, you know, for the first time about this classical theistic stuff might get the impression that classical theism's conception of God is so abstract and so cold and so unrelated to the religious life. And it's such a, a strange thing. And it's like, how can you even relate to God uh, in that way? Um, I would emphasize that classical theism, in my understanding, teaches us that every single moment of our existence, we are held in existence by God. If he didn't cause us to exist, we would, you know, we would go out of existence just like that. Every single moment of our existence is a gift from God, which he gives to us for our own sake and not because he needs anything or could even receive anything from us in principle. Um, so I think that classical theism and specifically its notion of the perfection of God and his total lack of dependence on creatures uh, teaches us to see life as a gift and um, to live our lives and enjoy our lives as a gift from God uh, before God, you know, at all moments. Well, I really, I really appreciate you guys coming on and uh, really looking forward to, to part two. So thank you guys again. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So just going to talk to the audience real quick. If you are enjoying the content that you're seeing from Capturing Christianity and you'd like to support this ministry, head over to patreon.com slash capturing Christianity. You can support us for $5 a month all the way up to, I think, $150 a month. We have several people that are at that tier. So we... Th- I. I really, really appreciate it. I mean, this ministry cannot happen without you guys supporting it. I, I do have uh, a family, and I have a wife and two very small kids. So, uh, and actually one of them was in here a little bit earlier. But if you'd like to support this ministry at all, that's the way to do it. Patreon.com slash Capturing Christianity. And we're doing a whole lot of things here. And like I said, we can't make it happen without you. So thank you so much in advance. And looking forward to part two of this discussion between Dr. Ryan Mullins and Stephen Nemesh. So we'll see you guys later. And until next time, Christianity is true.